He is a Denver native born of Denver natives. A former Denver chief deputy district attorney. He is now an active Colorado trial lawyer. Bright, independent, and full of fun, he has been part of the media for decades. This is The Craig Silverman Show. Oh, what a world, what a life, what a day. Saturday, January 22, 2022. It's cold. End of January weather here in Colorado. And to lighten the mood, we have on a comedian, a veterinarian, a climate change activist, a television star. He does it all, and now my podcast, Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald. I laid with him about the Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah, he was on tour with the Stones. Wait till you hear about that. Dave Gunders makes his solid contribution with Hole in the Head. I asked him for a funny song because these times are not necessarily that amusing, but this podcast is. And if it wasn't so serious, it would be funny. Jenna Ellis' involvement with Donald Trump, but now it appears she's a big part of this January 6th plot against America, which was not confined to January 6th, but involved her and Rudy. And it's just not that funny anymore. And I don't think it's nice to elevate Jenna Ellis, but my old radio partner, Dan Kaplis, has done that. I talked about it with Dave Gunders on the end of this show, but I wanted to give you a taste now. I'll play the sound. You'll remember Dan Kaplis and his producer, Ryan Schuling, talked about me debating Jen Ellis. I took up the offer. It was for charity. I told Dan Kaplis. I even tweeted it out. But no reaction, uh, no debate. But I do need to emphasize that I know Jen Ellis. I see what she's doing, and I don't like it. But Dan Kaplis does. A caller took on Jen Ellis, and Dan didn't like it. He accused the caller of unethical accusations, and then he defended Jenna, said the caller wouldn't call back. He actually did. He made good points. I kept listening, talked about Rudy Giuliani, decided the line trial by combat, and Dan said he would have to know the context. And then uh, you can listen to his podcast if you want to hear that, but I want to play it for you. What he said about Jenna Ellis this week and the quality of her lawyering and then what Jenna said about her quality of lawyering and then Peter Boyles, who kind of runs Denver Trump Radio, what he said about Jenna Ellis this week. I think it's fun and I want to amuse you. That's my goal. Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald, Dave Gunders, my discussion with the troubadour, and then stay tuned at the end for a great joke by Betty White. We talk about Betty White with Kevin Fitzgerald. He knew Betty White, Bob Saget, Louis Anderson, may they all rest in peace, Norm MacDonald and him were friends, Willie Nelson's still alive, so is Keith Richards. He's buddies with those guys. Wait till you hear this podcast. But first, here's Dan Kaplis extolling the virtues of a woman I consider a traitor to America, Jenna Ellis. He said, oh, she was fired from Weld County, a DA's job. I don't know if she was fired or not, but I know this. Because if somebody's let go from a job, that doesn't make them an incompetent attorney. Some of the greatest lawyers in American history were let go from jobs. And I can tell you as a guy who has practiced, uh, I believe, at a very high level for 38 years, been in a lot of courtrooms, and, and you can look at my track record. It's real. Jenna Ellis, I, I could count on one hand the number of, of, you know, practicing lawyers I've met, you know, who, who are as impressive as Jenna Ellis. I mean, she is absolutely brilliant, her command of the law. I think she's one of the last people any lawyer would want to see in the courtroom on the other side. So some Yahoo's going to call the show and say she's incompetent. Well, back it up. And looks like he chose to pack it up rather than back it up because he is gone, as I would expect anybody to be who would try to call this show and say she's an incompetent lawyer. Hey, there's more of this stuff on the back end of the show. But let me give you what Peter Boyles said about Jenna Ellis the next morning. 
unaware that the guy he shills for, I mean, advertises for in the morning, uh, has this love of Jen Ellis. Here's Peter Boyles, leader of Denver Trump Radio. Jenna Ellis, yeah. Jen, Jenna Ellis, I think if she lost three IQ points, they have to water her once a week. <laughs> That's exactly. No, you blow it in your ear and get yeah. a tune. I've, yeah. I've felt the no. same and, way but, when I heard her. She's not, she's not very bright, but. Now, Peter Boyles is hardly the final authority on anything except how to grub for money and bigotry, stuff like that, mobsters. Here's Jenna herself about her relative intelligence when it comes to, oh, I don't know, constitutional law. I went through uh, law school. Um, constitutional law was actually my worst subject. I got a D. I know. It was terrible. You didn't know that. <laughs> but in law school, it, I didn't understand it. So that's pretty fun, huh? Even more fun is listening to my buddy, Kevin Fitzgerald. Michael, of course, is a great sponsor of my show. But more than that, he's my lawyer, my end-of-life planning lawyer, And I've got two dogs. What about you? I have two dogs right now as well. And not only do you love your dogs at home with your kids and your wife, but you get involved with dog issues in your law practice. Tell everybody about that. So I will write pet trusts, which is you can earmark money to take care of your pets. Um, You know, a lot of people, you know, they've got their dogs and they love their dogs. But then if somebody were to, you know, if if you were to pass away, you know, who's going to take your dogs? Who would who would love your dogs as much as you do? I don't know that anybody would love your dogs as much as you do. But like I grew up with dogs. And so if I were to pass away, then my parents or my siblings could take the dogs. So when you set up a pet trust, you can dictate who's going to get those dogs and then who you can leave money to take care of the dogs as well. I like working with you, and I think you are ahead of your time. You have 15 different locations. How cool is that? It's, it is nice to be able to go to all the different locations and you know meet people where it's comfortable and more convenient for them. And nobody wants to drive from one part of Metro Denver to the other to meet with a lawyer. You will come to them. Yep, and I'll deal with traffic so you don't have to. Tell us how people can get in touch with you. My direct phone number is 720-394-6887, or they can go to my website, which is mobileestateplanning.com. And again, that's mobileestateplanning.com. And there's even a schedule, you know, there's a book and appointment link on this on the website. All right, Michael Bailey, thank you. I've been fighting for Colorado crime victims for the last four decades. There's a great new Colorado law. It allows victims as far back as January 1, 1960 to hold accountable the perpetrators and the organizations that allowed it to happen. If you were sexually assaulted, now is the time to come forward. Call me anytime you are ready at 303-861-2800. Ask for Craig, Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. I think most people in Colorado, maybe America, know Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald. He's one of those famous TV veterinarians, but I know he's a real veterinarian at Alameda East. That's what we've always called it. He comes from George Washington High School. He's Colorado through and through. And it's good to talk to you, Kevin, when I don't have to bring a a dog to you to put down. Well, it's nice of you to have me on. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you because I think we all need to have fun right now and get our laughs where we can. And I have to tell you that uh, when we talked and you agreed to do this show, you had a recollection of another time you were on the radio with me, and I thought that was spectacular, especially in light of current events. Why don't I just put it this way? What do you remember? <laughs> what do you remember about your relationship with me? I mean, I've seen you at uh, our workout facility through the years, and uh, on comedy stages, on TV. But uh, what's your recollection of your interactions with me? Well, you were a boy from the neighborhood. That's the first recollection. Correct. Okay. So I, I knew Silverman's. You know, sure. You know, at George Washington, 
and and then uh, then as you as a public figure, you know, with the law, you know, with with uh, yeah, my you, real you know, job, a, right? A, a, a DA, yes. Um, uh, in, in in politics, uh, you know, uh, outspoken and and uh, you know, follow your heart. Keep and then going. also your, your radio, your radio stuff. You know, know you as an animal lover. You know, bringing bringing animals in, and and then then also uh, as as a, a a workout guy. You know, so so yeah. I mean, you you're uh, you're multi dimensional like all of us. None of us are. are, well, are well, just, we you know, we will we will circle around back to that because you had a recollection of Capless and Silverman, and you got involved in a political debate of sorts, but. Let's circle back to that because I'm going to get in trouble with the other part of my show. I have a musical friend of mine, our troubadour, Dave Gunders, who followed you at CU. He kind of worried about the Vietnam War. We'll get into all of that. But he's a huge Boulder, Denver musician with an irrational love of the Rolling Stones. So if I don't start with the Rolling Stones before I get to all these comedians who have passed away that you're so close to, Kevin Fitzgerald, world-renowned comedian too, but let's start with the Stones. There's rumor that you know those guys. <laughs> you know, I could I could cure cancer and all anybody ever want to know is about, about working for the Rolling Stones. I, I, I grew up here, and Colorado's always had a, a good uh, – a center for music. We know Salt Lake City was far away, Kansas City is far away, uh, Albuquerque. So w- we were left to our own devices here. But there always was a good music scene, and uh, the the concerts and and Red Rocks and the early development of it was was uh, you know so crucial to our upbringing. Y- y- you know, it, you grew up here. The Red Rocks is a special place, and and but but the concerts were, and the concerts started. For kids, the promoters realized, and and the record producers, that there was this untapped uh, uh, source, this, this huge population of people that would buy records or go to concerts, and and so uh, it, it used to be just top forty radio, but then under underground radio, uh, the, the, the it used to be the the alternative radio uh, type, types of things started, and and they started to bring in concerts. And 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 bring in these different acts, and the, and acts would have to tour to push a record, their their newest album. And and it was a different day now. With with I don't, I don't understand the music business now. It's, it's hard with you know, just downloading things and downloading a track. We bought albums, and the albums were carefully crafted and put together, and and it, and the songs in order with great. Uh, it, album covers, and you'd read the jackets, and you'd you'd, you'd look at the words of your your heroes, and and you, you'd see how they dressed or what their hair looked like, and and tried to <laughs> tried to figure it out. So there there were the bands at the time were great. In Boulder, I worked at the Sink for Chuck Morris. What year are we talking about? Oh, 69, you know, seventy, and and uh, and then moved with him to Tulagi's. And and uh, Herbie Kavar, it was the owner of both places, and and Chuck managed both places. So I, I worked the door. Uh, he, he told me, "I'm going to give you a buck thirty nine an hour and a hamburger every shift." Now you're, you're an gonna... impressive physical specimen. Right then, what was your height and weight? Well, I, I'm I, I'm no you know I'm I'm no LeBron James, but you know, I'm I'm six four and and you know and, and at that time I don't know weight. You know, two ten or nine. so. Nice. So, to, you Bob, know, and six four, two ten. That's perfect. So, so I was a big kid, a, a big rangy kid, and, and I'd gone up to Boulder uh, to swim on a swimming scholarship, and and uh, the sport they don't even have anymore, and 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 so I worked the door for for Chuck, and and uh, uh, a buck thirty nine an hour a hamburger, and he told me you meet more girls in Frank Sinatra. So, so it was a, it was a great time to be a kid. The hill was was great. The STP family, the people were you know the the street beggars and and uh, you you learned about human nature 
the great thing about college is is your experiences and the people you meet as much as the classroom things that you you in in the discipline you get from studying but but you know boulder was great in those years and it probably still is it was like baghdad you know it was, <laughs> you didn't know what was going to happen next it was an exciting time like now I mean, the, the times now are, are, geez, with the time we live in now to be oh a kid. Oh, my gosh. But uh, I, we, we I, can't I get imagine. together. But the, the no. whole, I'm thinking about two loggies back in the day. I'm I'm younger than you, and I have an excuse for not going to the Beatles concert at Red Rocks in 64. I was only eight, and my parents didn't tell me about it. But you were a little older. Did you go, or do you kick yourself thinking, why didn't I go? No, I got to see him. I, I was uh, I was going to my dentist on 17th Street, and their their motorcade went by, and and so I, I looked in. I and and so, but anyway, when back they to, were staying at the Brown Palace, I know you're a Rolling yeah. Stones guy. You don't want to talk about the Beatles, but back to the Stones. So Mick and Keith well, walk into Tulagi's and say, no, no, "Who no, is no, that no, tall guy?" No, it, just, it, did, it didn't. It didn't start like that. It started off with 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 Chuck. Then left Herbie. And and you know it went on to his his own life and and uh, w- worked for Barry at, at Ebbets Field. In, Barry Faye, in, may rest yeah. in peace. Yeah. So in, Barry Faye was a oh he, he was it was bigger than life. I mean, you can say what you want about Barry, but he revolutionized the music industry and and realized the power of a tour. Where at, at the time when when Barry started every tour would have a different accounting and a different promoter in every city. And and so he, he went to bands and said, look, I'll do the whole tour across the country and you just deal with me and I'll sell the tickets. And, and it, you know, it, 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 in the very beginning, nobody knew what would happen when you get all the kids together in one place. And it, 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 uh, the Denver Pop Festival, I remember Barry walking around going, geez, how many sandalets do we need? Or, you know, how many times, how many hot dogs does a kid eat? Or, you know, what, what do we do? And, and it was, it was uncharted. It was uncharted. And we kind of did it by the seat of the pants. So Barry did the Stones tour in 69 and then 72, you know, and, and, uh, and brought in, you know, the different bouncers that we'd had working at different, you know, clubs and stuff. And, and so that was the start of it for me. And, and then, uh, I went on to other promoters to work for and other bands, but you know, working for the Rolling Stones was with being a little boy from Virginia Vale, you know, from Denver. It was like running away with the circus, you know. And you and you learn about uh, things. You learn about uh, it, it doing a job and and be, being proud of your work and, and trying to put a, a bow on everything you do and and. So it, it was it was fun. Our job was to try and get people in safe. I wasn't a, I wasn't close to the band. I didn't, you know, uh, he, uh, our job was to make sure that the people got in safely or how were we going to get the band from the airport to the venue, from the venue back to the hotel, how to keep people away from the hotel. And th- those years were, uh, it, it was magic. It, you know, I, I couldn't play an instrument, but it would you'd be close to the music. And and to to see the bands at the time, it was, you know, I I tell people now, you know, <laughs> your your favorite band sucks. <laughs> when I tell my nieces, they call my house Old Town from the stuff I listen to, but but it gets sampled by everything now, and and it, it was a, it was a special time for music, and any time is a special time. I remember my father walking around the house, you know, dusting and helping my mother clean on on Saturday morning. And, and you know they had a little tiny record player, and he was playing Frank Sinatra, snapping his fingers and going, "Now nah, this really swings." And I, I, we, I think my and, mom but, but, played uh, Doris Day a lot. Yeah, of K Sera Sera, and when the Red sure. Red Robin and and stuff yeah. like that. But in, don't you, be so. I, was, I don't want you to be overly modest throughout this because and we have well, a no, lot you, to you, talk about. But don't act like you don't know these guys and they don't know you. Well, you have to realize though that that y- you work for them. I mean, it's not like you're hanging out and and partying. Well, I mean, let's you're... stop right there. Who, when you say you work for them, who is the boss? Like, is Mick Jagger the boss, or are they all bosses? Well, for a long time, you know, for for better or worse, Mick had to deal with a lot of the stuff, you know, and and there, there's there's different bosses. I mean, there's 
there's a boss of of the tour, a, a tour director, and then there's there's uh, you know Charlie was in charge of the artistic th- stuff of the stage, and, and may he rest in peace. Yeah, and Keith was in charge of of uh, like logistics and the bouncers, and and, and you know and after a while, you know Ronnie Wood would do production stuff and look at that, and Keith was in charge of you know, talking to people about ticket prices and figuring that. And then you had different, you know, uh, uh, the tours became sponsored by, by big companies, you know, like Chanel and stuff. And Mm -hmm. you you would, you would see these types of of things that would happen later. So it, it became, at first it was the show and then it became the business. So, you know, there's a show and it's it's the business. business. It's it's show business. So you you saw it go from being a show to a big business. And how many years did you ride along with that? Well, I worked for Barry from 1969 until, until 85. Ah. So, and and then came back later to do some things, you know, I, I did, um, you know, Butch Greer that just passed away too, another legendary guy that was a promoter. And, um, you know, he, he got me, I, I did the Wu-Tang in 2002 because they needed somebody that had had some experience. And, and so, you know, it, it kind of came out of retirement, did 10 cities and, and, in and, and, and it, 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 at first I thought it wasn't my music, but then it was. And then you realize that each generation has their touchstone of music that they're going to remember. And that we, oh, remember when this song played or where we were? And and so in any generation, like I was going to tell you, my brother and I laugh at my father and we make this square sign with our fingers, you know, like draw a square in the air, like my dad was a square. But now when I listen to Frank Sinatra, some of that stuff really does swing. You know, with Nelson Riddle, you know, the, the orchestra. But what did they like about you? Sure, you're six four, two ten, and no, well, uh, was no, it your personal bigger. skills, your sense no, of humor? No. Was it, did you know how to control a crowd? Was that it? My boss was Jimmy Callahan, which was, was the, the head bouncer, and Tony Funches, you know, legendary bouncers. And, and they, they realized that it wasn't about bloody mouths. It was about no bloody mouths and how to avoid problems before they started and having some foresight. And so if you did that and, and you would get asked back and, and we learned about the crowds and we learned and, and eventually, too, the crowds got trained about what to expect. Like, oh, we can't bring this in or we can't bring that in or and, and you know, we need to line up. But I mean. It still there, there were tragic things like the, uh, you know, the the Cincinnati trampling with the Who, and and you know that wasn't part of us. And and but Barry was was great because it, it, with Barry was always there's going to be no festival seating, you know, and the kids are going to have a set ticket. And he's not going to run if he knows his seat is waiting for him. But if we just open the door and it's first come first serve, he just runs you whoever gets the best seats, you know, and and you know that that type of thing. And and the Stones were were. People can say what they want about the Rolling Stones, but I worked for them and, and, and knew them, and, and so it, uh, they were very professional. It, it was like the Marine Corps. I mean, it was really organized, and, and people say, oh, no, 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 nothing happens by chance, and, and nothing with them happened by chance for sure, and, and it was it was thought out. And, and you know, the, the nicest thing I, I think would be them as people, you know, the wheelchair kids, you couldn't have them on the floor. Uh, of, of the stadiums because what would happen is the kids when the lights go out they jump from the sides and everybody gets down on the floor to get close to the stage and if you have the wheelchair kids on the floor they get knocked out of the chairs and you're behind a barricade and can't help them until you can read get the floor so the, but they in those years they would put them all up in the same area have a wheelchair area. And it's tough here's a kid who wants to go to the concert with his friends and but he's got to be up in this area stigmatized is bad so Every show that that I worked, my my job was the front of the stage with the bouncers from that town, to you know try and show them what to do and and and, and you know have everybody act like we knew what we were doing, and and be on the same page. But every show, you know, I'd say, where are they? And I'd say, well, they're in, you know, section three twenty three up there. And he meant, where are the wheelchair kids? And there were maybe I, you know, how many chairs? And I said, well, there's 23 chairs. So I'm dating myself, but I would get 23 cassette tapes and 23 <laughs> T-shirts, and and it would put a towel over his head or a hoodie and take him through the guts of the place, and he, you know, it, uh, and then it it pop out, you know, and, 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 
to throw the hood off and put it. He wouldn't talk to him, but stay with him. But, he, you know, he'd, hey, we couldn't do it without you and put a cassette tape and a T-shirt on everybody's lap and then leave. And every time we walked back, he'd say, you know, how come? You know, you ever think about that? How come we're so lucky? And we can never forget how lucky we are. And I, I never forgot that. You know, he didn't do it as a photo op. He didn't tell the press he was doing it. He just did it, you know, and it was, it, you know. It, it just it's just nice sometimes you see people for what they are and, and you know they're, they're good people organized and smart and, and you know and, and kind of yeah. family have and, they you know, stood the test of time and i've never been to a performance but i know a lot of people like dave gunders who just can't get enough because uh they bring it every night they don't just mail it in is that your experience how you were on tour every night they give it their all well you know there there's a, a practice every day a band practice and, and so it, I mean, it's yeah they practice before they go out and, and get it you know dialed in you know and, and but but i think there's a special thing about live music in general I remember Keith saying one time, somebody asked him, who's the best band in the world? And he said, whoever's live on stage tonight. Because there's something about live music where you're sitting close to the band and, you know, you can see the sweat coming off the drummer and he's trying to keep up with his, the, the singer. And, and you know, and the, the, the bass is bouncing off the ceiling of the place. So there, there's there's something really good about live music. It doesn't come across on, on tape or, uh, you know, and doesn't come across on television. It, it there's something great about being in the place. Right, but Mick is a natural performer. But if I understand the Kevin Fitzgerald story, you know Keith Richards, perhaps the best? Every, everybody had their own people that they were assigned to. And, and so, you know, um, I I was closer to Keith, you know, and and, 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 and see, he was, you know, uh, he was the hippest cat in the world and, and really kind too and, and 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 smart and and nothing happened by chance you know they say like madonna oh you got to reinvent yourself every five years you know they do the same thing and you know for me I, it was always like about every five years a new generation of people discover the rolling stones and he just a guy comes around and plays the guitar again and does the same stuff but you know i i think uh keith it was instrumental for me in, in that at the end of the, oh, it was the, the 78 tour. He, he's in charge of the bouncers and he goes, why don't you do something? Why don't you go to school? You can't be a bouncer when you're 50. You know, you can, you know, you've worked for us these years and you do a great job, but you know, you, you, why don't you, I'll help you. I'll go, you, you know, go to school. So I came back to Denver and my brother picked me up at the airport and I said, Keith told me I got to get a grip on my life. <laughs> so I applied wow. to that school. You know, so, you know, pretty good career advice from, a, you know, a, a good person. And, and and I've seen him, in, you know, in, in the years that have come by. And I, I think he's proud of me, you know, and, and say, you know, I, I helped you on the right track. I did, because I think in one way, you know, the last time that I, I saw him and, and talked to him the, uh, two times before when they they were through and, and had had supper with him and, and well, when Callahan was still working for him. I don't even know anybody that works for him anymore. You know, I'm, I'm so old. It was so long ago, 50 years when I started, but uh, over. But, but uh, you know, I, I said, how long can you do it? And he said, I, I think we can do it as long as Charlie wants to do it. You know, and, and I don't know what will happen with Charlie gone. You know, I, I think they, they might still, you know. And But he, he also said, you know, the great blues people played into their 70s and 80s. You know, why, why wouldn't you as long as we can do it? Like, and he said, as long as we aren't a caricature of ourselves, like a bad Las Vegas cover band, you know, and, and you know, doing corny things, you know. And, 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 and But they've, they've stayed. He also said, you can't, he, he said, you can't be hip forever. You know, you can't stay hip forever. But he kind of, he kind of has. And so, but, but you, you, you had great things you'd say, you, you know, life learning things where he told me, you know, if you think you're hip, you're not. And if you don't, you are, you know, so if you well, think Well, he's you're, had so many great achievements. So have the Rolling Stones. But if I help the guy financially get his education, and he turned out like Kevin Fitzgerald, and he watched you on Animal Planet. He's probably seen your comedy act or is aware of it. When he said he was proud of you, did he follow all the success that you've enjoyed? Well, he knew about the TV show 
he knew about the TV show, you know, because uh, Callahan told me that that he had he had seen it and and uh, and would tell his kids, you know, hey, I I helped that guy. I made that guy. Oh, Dad, you don't know that guy. You know, <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I, I mean, the TV show. I never could watch it. It was too weird. You know, we did 11 seasons, you know, 97 to 2000. What was the name again? It was, it was called Emergency Vets. And it was just one of the first reality shows. We knew that Denver Comics, we knew that uh, Discovery was going to spin off all animals all the time. And 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 we, uh, Todd Jordan and I, a friend of mine, we had this idea for a, a different show, um, you know, and it, uh, with jokes. And I was opening for the Morris Animal Foundation for Betty White and doing, you know, jokes in front of her. And she'd come out. And, you, Morris Animal Foundation does wonderful things. They do conservation studies. She was a big animal an, animal advocate and was on the board for the, anim, the Morris Animal Foundation. And so we're going to talk a bunch about Betty because uh, yeah, her yeah, birthday so, 100th was this week. We've got a lot of comedians to talk about, but let's talk about the star of the show. My gosh, an 11 year run on national TV. I mean, my kids were impressed too. So it's, I said, I know that guy. And they said, Yeah, right, Dad. I said, yeah, I do. Well, you want to but, well, it wasn't. It was, but you couldn't. It's too weird to watch yourself on TV. I'd go, that's not my neck. That's my dad's neck. You know, <laughs> you see yourself on TV or you hear your own voice. And uh, that's also awful. You know, you hear. I, I You're got a telling voice. me. Yeah. No, it, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's something else. But uh, it's sort of like a podcast with video. You doing your job. And did you get off a lot of jokes or do you think they edited those out too much? Well, there was some humor in it, but mainly it was it was pretty straightforward and just reality stuff. It was never staged. The the problem with me with it it, it, it was so difficult because it was live. They would come for ten weeks uh, and film for seventy days. You know, it was Jim Berger's group and and, and Karen uh, Karen Weiser, Karen Schaefer Weiser. Uh, it was their baby, and and uh, they, they they proved that you could do. Uh, not in Los Angeles or New York, you could do a, a national TV show and, and do it with local talent because there were people living here that, you know, worked for the Today Show and worked every place and, and uh, great cameramen and Emmy awarding writers. And and so it, uh, they'd come for 10 weeks and film for 70 days. And out of that, they would get a 13 week show. Our, our shows were 30 minute shows and with the commercial it was 22 minutes of, of actual content. So there'd usually be three or four stories and, 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 you know, and they got kind of a formula after a while, you know, one would be real heart rending and one would be uplifting and then there'd be a funny one and, and, or an exotic animal or some weird animal. And this and, was and so, all at uh, Alameda East to your practice, right? Right. That's, I've been there since, uh, you know, I started as a preceptor there in 1982 so in this august i've been there 40 years oh my god and, and, well i've and, been and a lawyer can't... for 40 years so and you right, started so... late because you toured with the stones but you're older anyway it's at old. alameda and dayton and uh it's an incredible practice but how did they pick you did you pitch them or how did it happen well we had pitched a show todd and i we had pitched a show um it, 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 at the time in 97, the biggest show on television was was Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous was huge. And so we wanted to do a thing called uh, Pets of the Rich and Famous. And I want, I, I was opening for Betty and I was on, sitting on the airplane next to her and I said, Betty, and, and she was lovely. And, and I said, uh, I, I want to do a TV show. Well, yeah, what do you want to do? And it's like, well, it, at the time, you know, there were different people, uh, well-known people in Denver, you know, John Elway or the dog or whoever that would come in and and I'd say I want you to interview you know famous people about their pets you know and and um uh, you know a couple of the Denver Nuggets had had exotic snakes or you know somebody would have something so and so oh that's a great idea so we pitched the idea and the woman really liked it at Animal Planet but then the, that woman she was in charge of new programming got fired. And the new woman said, no, no, you know, really not about comedy. But she was, you know, ER is really big. 
at, at the time. What about an animal ER re- reality thing? You know, George Clooney's thing is this ER. So so we did emergency vets, and in you know high noon was Burger's outfit, and they were wonderful. And, and you, know, you played the George Clooney part. Wow. No. Yeah. No. I, Come on. I don't did. be mad. No. No, no, no. We had Steve Peterson who was so handsome and Dr. Taylor, my boss. And now, See, no, that's I, I, what I would worry about. What Are people showboating? It's like if lawyers were followed around like that, and some are, there's a fear of showboating. Well, you really couldn't showboat because it was emergency stuff and you had to, it, you, had to you were working. You know, I, we in the beginning, we wondered about that and we wondered about how the I I didn't think people would let their animals be filmed, and the whole time we did it, I think there were two people that said no, 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 put me on, and I think those people were probably deadbeat dads or something, you know, that didn't didn't want to do their child support. But most people wanted to be on. The, the danger became after a while that the people which you act toward the camera, you know, and and you know, and you you don't want that. But they said they'd be like a fly on the wall. Berger said, and you know, Karen. Uh, Karen Weiser said, we'll be like a fly on the wall. And they were, there was a, a sound guy and a producer and a, uh, a cameraman. And, and, you know, they, they'd just be in the corner and, and, and they, they, uh, it, yeah, it turned out all right. The problem with it was not being staged. If I asked you three things about uh, a particular defense of a client, you know, in the law, I said, uh, listen, I'm going to come back in, in five minutes and and I'm going to uh, ask you these three questions. Right. So think about these questions. You had time to kind of get an answer. Mm-hmm. But what would happen, it, it, they would be asking these questions just while the dog is bleeding. And and, you, and I'd look at the thing later and go, that's all I could think to say. You know? Oh, my but, God. But, but it, uh, it, it was. If I did, there it, weren't, was there a worry that when you ask critical questions like what was in the cabinet that the dog ate or whatever, that yeah. the person would choke because there's a camera in their face? <sighs> Maybe I shouldn't use the word choke. Anyway. No, no, it, no, that's right. That's right. Uh, no, because it's, it's, it's a, a bad question. pun in that. In that no, it's, it's, it's all right. It's all right. The Animal Planet wouldn't show to their credit, they wouldn't show drug cases. They wouldn't show stuff. I remember the first marijuana dog that we had had come in and these kids had come in and they were high and, and they had this little puppy and you could put him in any position and you could smell the patchouli oil and they were young and had glasses. And I'd been in the sixties, so I knew what was up and <laughs> I knew the score. And so I said, was there a party last night at the house? Had, could the dog gotten in it? No, no, no. And, you know, I said, look, you know, you, you, you can tell me, you know, you're not, I'm not going to prosecute. You're not going to. And, and so the kids said, well, you know, about four in the morning, some dude came in and played our record player and partied with the dog. And then, then he left. I said, no, you didn't get up. No, you know, we didn't think to get up. We just could hear him partying and partying with the dog. And, and, and so, you know, it's four month old Husky puppy, you know, and obviously <laughs> dilated pupils and stumbling. Oh my God, what year was and that? So, and now 10,000 <laughs> cases later, right? Yeah. I bet so you could. Is, I could qualify you as an expert witness on a few things. As a veterinarian, <laughs> for sure. A movie star, so to Not speak. Reality star. show star. But it, it, it crowd control so, expert. Yeah. So I told I told this guy I said I said uh, so what happened? He, he, a dude came in, yeah, some dude, and and he partied with the dog, and and so I said, and you didn't get up, no. I said, let me get this right. Some dude came in, partied with your dog, you didn't get up. I said, is that what you're going to stick with? He goes, yeah. I go, son, that's the damn dumbest story I've ever heard. So tell me what happened. We can help this puppy. And then the, the girl said, you know, the dog got into a, a bag of pot under the bed. And I said, now we're getting somewhere. And then we, you know, I, but I looked at the film later and the, the cameraman, was, the, the film was shaking because he was laughing so hard. Because the kid said, some dude. And I told him, oh, that's, that's like damn, law and story. order. But, but they couldn't show it. They didn't show it. You know, that never came on. So they. It could be law they, and order DVM, right? It's, it's, it's different now. You know, this, this was the very beginning of of reality tv in fact uh the 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 uh the crocodile hunter came two weeks before he was killed to, to may he rest uh, in peace too right may he rest we're going to be saying and, that a lot today and and so uh he, he came to film i was doing a rattlesnake study with a buddy of mine from the denver zoo and, 
putting radio transmitters and rattlesnakes along the front range and finding out how far they move and how they far they range, how many babies and what they eat and who eats them. It was a great study. So he wanted to film our study, and he did. You know, and he was lovely. He brought T-shirts for everybody and sat with everybody. And, you know, and they had kind of rehabilitated him from the guy. You know, in the very beginning, it was just. You know, if he if he would have lived, what he could have done for conservation of animals mm-hmm. worldwide, because he really could connect with people. He, the guy had an aura, and and and, and he was lovely. I'd met him ten years before when we were showing our pilot to the network executives. He was showing his pilot. His pilot was incredible. It was him in the darkest marsh of Australia at midnight, with his wife snagging crocodiles out, out of the marsh, and and uh, <laughs> he turned toward the camera and pushed his wife out of the back of the boat, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, crocs are attracted to vibrations. <laughs> using me wife, using me wife as a decoy, you know, flap your arms, dear, flap your arms. And I thought it's going to be huge using your wife as a decoy, but no, he was lovely. And, and if he would have lived what he could have done, but so it was an interesting experience, but you know, you, you realize what you are as you know, you're not a star, you're, you're a veterinarian, you know? And, and so I, I you know, I kind of, had a buffer because I never really watched the show. And, and, well, and time we, we, out. I hope you got paid. I mean, you kind of pitched it. I hope you worked out a great deal. Well, we didn't. Um, you know, Dr. Taylor at the time, and you know, we he, he decided, you know, listen, we aren't movie stars, and we we try to show the profession at the time what we could offer, and 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 so no, I think if we would have cut a deal now, it'd be very different. But but I think at, at that time. Um, High Noon was generous and gave us a uh, a location fee, like cops. That was what was standard, and and so they bought some equipment for the place. But no, I I never really really benefited from you know we we weren't doing you know I I didn't have <laughs> t-shirts with my face on it or anything. I'm you know? not feeling bad for you because you never gave up your day job, and that's cool. No, and you got well. I mean, it's it's what I do. I mean, right. I don't play golf. I, I'm 70, and you know, I, I I think I got five more in me. I mean, you work until your health, you know, fails probably. But in so much of what people do uh, comes from their self-image, and your self-image often comes from your job. Not always, and not that's not the only thing. Like we said, we're not one-dimensional. But I don't, I don't right, know. Right, but so uh, I, you you should keep going because you're good at what you do and you get satisfaction out of it. But it's a tough profession. You see a lot of tragedies, people at their lowest moment, if their dog gets hit by a car or God forbid, well, it's, any it's, number of things right. could happen. It, that's right. It, but, you know, I realize that the fate of the Western world doesn't hang in the balance of what I do. But, but you know, it, it, you're making your little side of the street better. And, and it's changed so much. In the, the American Veterinary Medical Association in, in 1957 did a study where they asked, do you think your pet is part of the family? And in 1957, 43% of Americans said they thought the pet's part of the family. Skip ahead 50 years later, they did it in 2007, and they asked the same question in the telephone survey. And 97% of Americans said, so, you know, there are these cultural changes, these shifts, you know, these big shifts in, 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 in the, the public opinion and, and you know, legal marijuana. I mean, it's amazing what you and I have seen in our lifetime, legal marijuana and then uh, legal legalized sports way of drink. Le- le- legalized but, gambling. But it, it, dogs are sort of like the Rolling Stones. No offense to your buddies, but they've always been great. I've always loved dogs. I've never thought that you could have really a nice home without puppies in it. It feels so empty when we don't have dogs. Well, I, I think there's there's special, you know, there's a special relationship. I find that most people that that don't like dogs, either they had a bad experience as a young person, or they never had one, and and so I, I think. Or that, they're a shithead like Donald Trump, but that's me saying <laughs> it. All right, go ahead. Well, well, I, so so there's been a shift in in you know our, our public opinion. And veterinary medicine has has been a a great profession for me. I, I think it's going to become even more of one as we see, you know, like the pandemic. This thing, I, I've had virologist friends, uh, veterinarian and human physician virologists, that have been saying for years that something big was coming. And if you really look at it, you know, since two thousand, you know, there's been. There, there's been uh, five pandemics before this. You know, we, in uh, 1999, 2000, we had West Nile, a, a novel virus. 
then in in uh, SARS one, and then H one N one. 2003 to It had never been no. anything like this. And honest no. to God, Kevin, I never heard the word uh, coronavirus in law school. I, I just, it wasn't no. on my bingo card. I know it was not no. only predicted no. to come, but tell me, great scientist, will it go well, away? Are we ever going to get well, back to normal? Well, these, these things you know, emerge, you know, so, so let's go back and look. So we got West Nile in 2000, then we got SARS-1, then we got H1N1, then we got MERS, you know, then, then we had, uh, uh, Zika, you know, and, and, uh, Ebola, you know, both in 2015, 2016, and now, now this one, you know, and, and, and so I, the one thing that these things have in common is that they're, they're animal derived, they're animal origin, you know, bats usually. And, and why bats? Well, bats are communal livers. They live a long time and they can live a long time with viruses. And we don't know why they, they can get rabies and carry it for a long time. Wait a second. I, I thought this comes from a Hunter Biden in a Chinese lab with Dr. <laughs> yeah. Fauci stirring the pot. Am I misinformed? <laughs> Uh, it's just such a funny time, and nobody trusts anything anymore. You no, know? but I, sir, I, it's like climate change. We're going to get to that too. It's I studied political science. I honestly don't understand where viruses are coming from. You do. You know animals. You know science. When you tell me, hey, these viruses are coming from uh, bats and stuff like that, I believe you. But you know, there's a lot of people arguing about that. Well, they can't argue about it because we know the, the the sad thing now is how people it, distrust science. And it's amazing that Americans distrust science in a country that invented the transistor, invented the polio vaccine. You know, you're, you're too young. But in, in 1959, you know, we got the salt vaccine. And I remember my mother saying you can't go to Congress Park swimming pool because it's in the water. And, and there were kids in your class with big Forrest Gump like you know uh, braces on their legs, and and the the, vac- the vaccine came out in '59. They brought us all down to the gymnasium. You rolled up your sleeve and got the shot. And then later on, it was a sugar cube. In later years, but you know polio was was dreadful. And and I don't remember any mothers at the time saying I don't want him to get the, not you know to get that shot. And and so the the, the anti-vaxxer thing. Is is very unusual and 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 hard for me to understand. In, in a country that uh, put the man on the moon and invented the transistor, invented the internet, you know, for better or worse, and 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 it would, had all these these great strides. And in the last 150 years, the biggest thing is seen is the scientific method where we test and and uh, test things and and test theories. And and then if it fails, then we go back to the drawing board and test something else and see and try and come up with how things work. And and that's it, you know. And science is is you know it's it's not. It, there's no room for you know what ought to be or what you think should be. It's what is, and it's only the truth. And so the right, the, it's the way it's put out there. And I can tell you, as a non-scientist, I look. I'm double vaccinated, boosted. If they had a fourth, I'd do it. I like those things. I believe in science, but at the same time. I'm hearing conflicting things, whether it wards it off. We've seen these breakthrough infections from the start. They said, get whatever vaccine you can get. But anybody who looked at the data knew J&J was not top choice for me, and I was lucky enough to get Moderna. So you have to do your own research. And right now, I am a little confused whether uh, these boosters are going to ward all this stuff off and whether masks really help. I wear it, but... I I know where the disinformation is coming from, most of it. But well, well, the problem is, Doctor Google. Anybody can get on the internet right. and find something, and everybody's an expert now. Everybody reads uh, one paragraph or a, a headline and and then spouts it. Okay, where you've got people that have been studying this their whole lives. Okay, and and you know, and dedicated and and have dedicated a life. To, to a science of, 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 of learning about something and, and experimenting with something and researching something. So, you know, I, I think the distrust of, of, of science is, is, is so scary. It's like a new flat earth society, you know? I mean, you, <laughs> you get people that still think the world is flat. And it, it's like, have you never seen the pic? Oh, you know, it's, it's fake. This is fake. This is fake news. This is whatever. 
and it's so dangerous, you know, and, and people are so distrusting. And part of it, the media has brought on themselves, you know, it, it, it so ratings driven and, and so it has to be theatrical. And, and, you know, I, I remember with Animal Planet, they, they said, you, you know, don't go too into that. A lot of that stuff's boring, and, and but, but it's stuff people need to know. And a lot of stuff is boring. But if we look at uh, all of the, the articles, you know, in like People magazine, you know, <laughs> a little paragraph and a giant picture, and you know, Michael Jackson's hair on fire, boom, next on to the next thing. And, and so uh, people just trust the media so much. And it, part of it's their own fault. But in the old days, it was, you know, Walter Cronkite telling you the news and it wasn't his opinion. It was it wasn't you didn't know if he was a Republican or a Democrat. You kind of had your ideas, but but it wasn't. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, Fox News and, and or or the counterpart, I mean, it's it's ratings driven and people say I, I, I totally agree. But uh, people kids. go to the art, to the uh, sound so people who listen to my show want to know, well, what's the right answer on this stuff? And that's why I have a smart guy like you on. And mm-hmm. with regard to the pandemic, give people your best advice. I assume it's get vaccinated, get boosted, wear a mask. But but you tell me, what you, how, how should they live their life? Should they go work out at the gym? Should they go to movies, go to any restaurant they want? What should they do? You were right when you said, "Why well, we've never seen anything like this and, and we're on uncharted territory, but really we're not because we have the 1918 uh, flu epidemic. And what happened then was uh, by 2021, uh, by 1921 and 1922, it, it, these mutations it ha- happened and it had mutated to a, a much less virulent, uh, you, you know, uh, mm-hmm. aggressive form. And, and, and so I, I think... People have to understand the mutations and what these viruses are, and you know they're they're only alive when they're in living cells, and and they can they they can change readily, but they change when during the transmission, and and they change during transmission. So the more times it can be transmitted, the more it can change. So if we keep these pockets of of unvaccinated people, the the virologists call it kindling, and and it's where we have the, the potential for infection. But if you've, you've got the virus bumping into a vaccinated person, I mean, all you have to do is look at the statistics in places like St. Anthony's, their emergency room and stuff, where they're talking about, you know, 82 and, right, and, and I, I, I totally are, are buy unvaccinated. that. And, and so um, in the people that it, there are breakthrough things, certainly there, there are breakthrough infections and, and it, 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 the ability for people to, to get infected. Right, but we have roughly a third or more of America that won't get vaccinated. Can we get out of it if they get sick and they either die or we develop herd immunity? Well, herd health, right, they talk about 70 percent and, you know, you need at least that. And, and it, it, eventually... You know, the thought is if you, you read, I get the New England Journal of Medicine every week. And, and if, if you look at the articles, they're talking about how long it's going to take for eventually everybody to be exposed to this. It's going to take a while. And if we also look at studies done in, in 1918, um, particularly uh, 12 army bases where six of them wore masks and six of them they didn't. The, the the bases where they had the mass that were much better with people less infected. So the mass offers at least some protection. You know, it's not. And the better your mass, the better your chances are. And st- it's still cloth masks and stuff you worry. But but uh, the, the viruses are... And you've are, been wearing masks for a long time. And it occurs to me that those masks, that emergency room beds wear, kind of kept you guys from showboating too much you know, flashing a smile while you're sewing a cat up or something like that. But, well, that's probably right. But I'm worried that we'll always have unvaccinated pockets around the world, not even close to 70%. And the interconnectivity of the world means that variants will keep emerging and they could be deadlier. Or am I worrying too much? Is it we got to get through it and then 100 years from now it might happen again? Well, let's go back and look at viruses, okay? Viruses are, are seasonal, okay? There are seasonal outbreaks like the flu. And so what virologists do is they watch South America, watch the Southern Hemisphere, 
where uh, the seasons change it differently. And, and so they look at what the big variant is for the flu. And then based on that, based on their flu vaccine. Now, sometimes there's a mismatch and, and we don't we don't get the right uh, the right variant. But I think what you'll see eventually is that the vaccines will have several different variants. And there, there's new variants that, uh, that are less uh, publicized so far that they, they've found, you know, ADA and NU. And, 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 uh, so right. you, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be, this thing will keep mutating. But a mutation doesn't necessarily have to get more infectious and more virulent. It can get, get you know, forms that are less, less, less deadly. And, and so it can go either way with these mutations. The problem is that the mutations will keep, you know, happening at a higher rate as long as there's big pockets of unvaccinated people. And if we look worldwide, you know, we we probably do a poor job in in um, you know underdeveloped countries and right. Getting we do a poor job in our own country. But the difference between this and any flu of our lifetime are the lockdowns, the uh, restrictions, and it's killing people. And well, let's go to your show business part because just today, meatloaf is dead. Louis Anderson, I bet you knew him, and those were big guys. So a lot of guys who are about your age, who don't stay as fit as you do, they're dropping off like flies. Am I right? Well, that's right. Bob Saget, I mean, he was fit. And, you know, it just we're getting to the point at the time that, you know. Do you you think that was COVID, Bob? Well, you had COVID, you know, leading up to that, you know, the week before. So I, I think they don't know. Oh, my I'll God. I listened to his podcast, the one he did right before he said, I'm going to go on vacation. I'm probably going to get COVID. Then I'm going to go on a tour. I thought he was joking. But did he really get it while he was on Christmas vacation? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And and and, and so uh, – I, I've worked with him a lot, and, and in fact, he did my roast when I turned 60. And, and well, let, you, let's you, talk you, about you, Bob you, Saget. I loved yeah. him. I feel so bad. My condolences to you and all his friends. I was just a fan, and I read his book. He's a proud Jewish guy. He was funny as hell. And just like you and I have kind of different lives, even in show business, he was, you know, Danny Tanner, good pops, and then he could be the nastiest guy on the stage. But he made me laugh, so I'm going to shut up. Tell us about the late, great Bob Saget. Well, the first thing people should know about him is that, man, he was a student of comedy. He really took it serious and, you know, took his shows serious and tried to keep synthesizing in new things and, and changing it and having the thing evolve. And, and, but he was, he was a nice guy. He was nice. And, and, and he... Uh, he didn't have to be nice because at one time he'd had the two biggest shows on television, you know, with, he was in, you know, the uh, full house was huge. And at the same time, America's funniest you know, you know, videos. And, and, you know, he, he was the first host and, and, you know, made millions on, on that with syndication. And, and so, uh, he he didn't have to do comedy, you know, and, and I, I think people have to, they say, well, why do you do comedy? I think it's because you have to, you know, not because you have to because of money, you have to just because of some drive and some, maybe there's something wrong with comics that they want approval. You know, if you see most people, 98% of people say their biggest fear is public speaking, but comics want to get out there and be on stage. So there's really something wrong with us, I think, to, to, to do that, you know. I, I think... Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Thank God there are people like you. But he was a uh, he was a wiseacre. He he was specialized at wisecracks, and that's you know that works at GW, right? I bet you were the class clown there. I tried to make people laugh next to me. That that's really no, what was, it's about. I was, I was the assistant class clown. I, I would do it if the guy was sick or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if the man got me sick, then they bring the me out. Substitute, I was, right? I was, I was a disappointment act. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was. Yeah, I was. I was the assistant. Yeah. Well, uh, so how, did, I, how, I, first, how did you end up? Yeah, let's go back to you because this is going to lead to Bob Saget. How did you end up on the comedy stage? I've always liked comedy. I, I've always liked comedy, and if you look at the comics. The best comics are Jewish or Irish in the very beginning. And we look at, you know, George Burns and Georgie Jessel and those guys. And I, I loved that style. I loved the one-liner style. And and so I, I got to when I was bouncing 
I got to uh, do security uh, one time for George Burns, and I, I asked him, I, I said, Mr. Burns, what's the secret of comedy? He goes, oh, well, there's only five jokes. He goes, there's a current event joke where something happened. You can do that. That's good. He goes, there, there's a, a an ethnic joke. He goes, don't do that. We're all the same. He goes, what are you, Irish? I go, yeah. He goes, yeah, you can do any Irish jokes. I can't. He goes, I'm Jewish. I can do Jewish jokes. You can't. He goes, but yeah, stay away from me. He goes, and then there's a sex joke. He goes, you know, don't do those. He goes, those those can be offensive to the crowd. And he goes, the best kind is the fourth kind, and that's a a, a self-deprecating joke, you know, and, and you make fun of yourself. You draw the ire of the audience onto yourself, and, and that that's endearing. And then he said, I said, well, what's the fifth kind? He goes, oh, boat axe. I go, boat axe? He goes, yeah, a guy on a cruise ship, a guy that's got a talking duck or a guitar. He's a ventriloquist or a juggler. <laughs> He's got some gimmick. So I, I, so I always liked comedy. Oh, my gosh. So, Let me just stop there. That, that was sensational. George Burns was fantastic. Oh, God. One of my favorite movies, John Denver, George Burns. And for you to get that advice from George Burns, that's epic, Kevin. Well, he was, he was something. Like, you know, I told him, I said, you've seen it all. You know, you did vaudeville, then radio, then movies, then television. Then, you know, it's, you've done stand-up. I mean, you've done the whole thing, you know, and, and – and and he he said that stand up George Burns believed that modern stand up came from a, a, a Jewish tradition of these guys who went from town to town and they hired him for weddings or funerals to make people laugh and and the one liner style of you know a bum 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 punchline bum 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 punchline is really Yiddish you know the, where the the verb and the action thing is at the end you know and 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 so if you looked. You know, I, I I used to love Henny Youngman and, and you know those guys. I just die. You know, I mean, they were they were so funny and to me. You know, and, and to a lot of people, to me not, too. not so much. And and you know, my father said, "Oh, this is old. This is old stuff." And you know, I'd hear Milton Berle, I'd lose my mind. You mm-hmm. know, and, and and so he just he just he just liked it. You know, and and so in the eighties there was a huge comedy boom with clubs and two clubs here with the. Uh, the, the uh, comedy works in George McKelvey's comedy club and, and there were amateur nights. And, and so we, I had a friend that was doing it and he was getting paid and I thought, geez, it's not funny. It's not even funny. So I started doing it in the beginning. You stink, you know, you're a talking head. I had like three jokes and I couldn't look at the crowd and you have stage fright. But after a while, if you keep at it, you know, and work at it and take it serious and, and listen to people and, and keep working and you, you kind of can build a, you could build something up and, and now your know, buddy who you thought years. sucked at comedy does he know that he's the inspiration for you you never tell anybody that they're not funny <laughs> no you but know, what a yeah, great I, story because i, I honestly <laughs> you you go to countless comedy clubs and i go and some people are funny and some aren't and i think everybody in the audience who's got a little showboat in them says Hey, I think I could do that. Are, are, is it accurate? In your case, you could. Well, <laughs> I think everybody has a sense of humor. You know, everybody has a. When, when I worked for the Rolling Stones, he said that every song he plays has satisfaction in it. You know, mm-hmm. it, that everybody had one one melody, one rhythm, one thing, and I think that's really true. People have one joke, maybe. I'm still trying to find my best joke, but you know, you try and you try jokes, you try different things that work and there's different styles. There's storytellers. I never liked storytellers because it's, you know, 20 sentences of build up for one punchline thing. And and I like misdirection punches, you know, where right. it's like boxing where you don't know where the joke's going and all of a sudden they wham you, you know, Dave Attell and some of these people, Norm MacDonald, you know, I just, you know, I just the people that, that my favorites and people have the different favorites that they like and, you know, so much of it comes from likability. If you like the guy, you know, I saw this study from Rutgers that said with public speaking or a doctor or whoever in the public that you're meeting, people decide in the first 15 to 30 seconds whether they like him. And it comes from eye contact and smiling and whether the people seem warm or seem fake. So people can tell. And, and the, the biggest secret about comedy is that the audience is on your side. They want you to be funny. They don't want to see somebody get up there and suffer. They don't want to see somebody get up there and die. 
You know, they, right. that's the biggest. Secret. You bring they're, up, they're like a, a, yeah, go ahead. They're I'm like sorry. a, they're like a mirror. If if you're confident, they're confident. Right. They, if you know, if you go up, oh, I hope you find this funny. No, you go, hey man, this is funny. It's like you, you know, tonight I'm working with uh, Bobby Collins. You know, at the Comedy Works South out there I'm doing two shows tonight and two tomorrow. And oh my he's, he's a he's an old old older guy and he, very funny. Been doing it for years and 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 there's different styles and and so there's kind of one liner styles and. Well, you know, it's joke, 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 joke. And that, that's what I like, you know, that people can't, you try and stack it. So you got your best jokes in the beginning and best jokes at the end. Newer jokes, you kind of sandwich in and see if they'll work. And, and, you know, the audience doesn't have to laugh. You have to earn it, you know. And so I was getting scared for a long time and getting stage fright that I was too old. This, the second show on Friday night downtown, Comedy Works downtown, there, the average age is 24. So I'd walk out with white hair and, I could just hear him just, oh, who's this old guy? So I started doing these younger, all these little workout rooms around that the young kids are running where they come on late at night and there's just young people. And I realized that if it's funny, it's funny. You know, my job is an old guy and a young guy sitting next to each other and they're both laughing, a black guy and a white guy, a man and a woman. You know, it's, it, comedy is inclusive and it makes us laugh. And, and most people can see the humor in things. And I think most people are, are funny. There, some people aren't aren't so funny you know some of my <laughs> i don't know you you've known people in your life that that that, that yeah, it didn't really have a sense of humor but i think most people do have and, right they're yeah, called you, trump you, supporters you no i'm kidding. <laughs> no no I, I, there, there's funny republicans you know and and, and, and uh i don't know I, I don't do politics I don't, I don't do politics like that because you know you why alienate half the crowd or do right you know, or do well or because do, you just you're walk out 70 there. and you're speaking out and you could do it on the podcast to the extent you want to but i i'd say your act is pg would that be fair pg 13 yes yeah, so you can work you can work more if you work clean it's harder to write a clean joke than a dirty joke but if you can it's 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 great and you can do corporates you know, you can do, you can do, uh, mm -hmm. do things for different companies and and do things where you can't if you, you know. And and it, the problem now is that everybody's offended so easily, you know. And and people maybe kind of want to be offended, you know. It's it's like, geez, I mean, did you notice it, it says comedy works? <laughs> it doesn't say serious works, you know. <laughs> right, but it is work for you. <laughs> and I'm wondering tonight, when you take the stage, will you be excited? Always excited. It's getting like getting shot out of a cannon. You know, it's this. This is you know. You can't go out flat footed. You have to be up for everyone. And and you see, the crowd doesn't know. They don't know what you've done before. This is like boxing. They don't care. You had fifty fights before and did well. It's the fight you're in, and you got to know your audience and kind of you know get the level and 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 see it and grab them. And and so, and you try and do some current event stuff. I'm gonna do some COVID jokes tonight. You know, you just say, you know, I. I uh, during COVID, I made a sex tape. I call it Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell them don't laugh too hard, you know, because yeah. they're breakthroughs. Yeah. And yeah. Are you worried about making people laugh too hard? Have you ever done that, or is that your goal? I mean, literally, when I was sort of a class clown, the, the key is to get somebody to make a disturbance or to have milk come out of their nose. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, people say, you know, you know, they say, well, what about the Fuhrer? And I say, Hitler? I, I didn't like him. Right. Not at <laughs> they all. They don't know it. They don't know English. You know, they don't know Fuhrer. You know, no, I, I don't. My goal is to get off, you know, is, is to get out there and get some punches in and and, and, and give them a good show. And, and I, I'm not an A-lister by any means. But I, I really believe that, you know, there are guys like me. There's guys like me all over the country that are very funny that you've never heard of that work you know, 200 nights a year, and are, and are killer. You know, there's a lot of them in Denver. There's a lot in Boston. You know, some of these places that are comedy centers, and and they're just they're just killer. We, there's so many good comics here in Denver that that aren't nationally known that should be. And and Nancy Norton won the uh, uh, Seattle Comedy Count Contest, and also won uh, Boston. Uh, you know, Sam Adams, uh, Josh Blue from America's Got Talent, and, and won Last Comic Standing. Uh, Chris Voth is on the road with, with, with Ron White. Um, you know, Todd Jordan writes for everybody from Kathleen Madigan to Larry, the cable guy, Rick Kearns, a great writer, great comic. Uh, 
you know, we're, we're really lucky here. Matt Berry went on and did great stuff in, in Los Angeles with, you know, producing different shows and uh, Desperate Housewives. And so we're, we're lucky, you know, Ros- Roseanne started here. You know, so, so many people have gone on, you know, uh, Timmy Kelleher writing uh, scripts and, uh, you know, first kid. And, and so we're, it's, it's a great comedy community and it's a great learning place. And people are, are but we got guys like Lewis Johnson that have been doing it for years. And, and, and it, it just, it, I've had some them. of these guys on, but this is about you. And I know you want to pay tribute to Bob Saget because he was, it was shocking when he was uh, found dead. Do you, and you, yeah, you've kind of broken news, and, and you would know better than I would. I, I followed, I watched his widow talk. First of all, how did you meet Bob Sagan? And you opened for him. I assume that was his choice. He must have liked you. Well, that's right. I got to do a bunch of cities with him because, um, you, you know, they you have a little manager and he has different clips, and they show these people different clips of, of different comics to open for. And they showed him my clip, and he liked it. And you know, same thing with Joan Rivers or for Norm. You know, they they liked me, and then took me with them. So, you know, it, you have to set the stage right. You know, some people say, well, they liked you because you weren't that funny, and they they couldn't they could follow you. But no, they, they want a good show. I think I'm like I'm like a good studio musician. I bring in my bass and sit down and make the sound bigger. You know, and any show I'm on is better because of it. But nice. that's, that's just me. I mean, what a talent, which is uh, you share the stage and you, you're trying to make the other guy look good and you're not going to ruffle feathers yeah, I, I, and, you, and you are different. My God, the names you're tossing down, Joan Rivers, may she rest in peace. These are top flight people. Well, she, she was a student of it, too. You know, she was so she was so talented and, and so nice. I mean, she she had time for everybody that came up to her afterward. It's just something from signing an autograph to taking a picture with him. And, and I'd always go, you know, my old bouncer days to protect your people. And like, Joan, come on, you ready to go? No, these are my people there. We pay the tickets. We got to, you know, she, she, she was kind. She really okay, was. Okay. Let so me ask was, you this. Cause she was gone too soon. That's kind of Jewish woman who could have lived to be 112. I've seen them before, but she was a victim allegedly of medical malpractice. You are a doctor, veterinary doctor, but I bet you have an opinion about that, do you? Well, I think there are procedures done where that, that are typically very safe, but they, they have an odd percentage of people that react differently, and and they, they aren't ready for the, the uh, problem, the emergency. They should the, be. That, that, that they should be, and they should, they should have handled one before, and maybe they never had it. They've always been lucky. And so what I know from anesthesia, in, from from animals and anesthetizing animals for 40 years, you don't know the outcome. Everyone, every animal is going to react differently. And, and, but you have to have the, the uh, everything in place to handle the emergency afterward and to, to deal with it and, and to know what you're going to do and have walked through it before. And so I, I think as it came out in her case, they, they weren't ready. You know. Shocking, terrible loss. But Bob Saget, it's recent. They just had his funeral at uh, out in L.A. Uh, what a loss! Um, what oh, was yeah, he like? And, and people, well, people that knew him knew that you know, you know, he found dead in a hotel room, and, and you think right away foul play. And most people would think that, but if you knew him, you knew that wasn't true because he wasn't a drug guy, and 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 he worked out and tried to take care of himself. And he was sixty five, and and. Um, you know, he, he had with all uh, due respect and I can look a little puffed up at time, although right now I'm spelt and all that. You should see me, but he looked like he'd put on weight. Well, he'd never been 65 before. I know. <laughs> you know Tell you me know, about he, it. Right. I mean, it's harder. It's, it's just, it's, you know, and, and there's genetics and, and, and then, then there's 65 years of living on earth, you know, and 65 Correct. years of being on the road, eating road food. And you're, you know, you're, you're not eating at your own home. You're not sleeping in your own bed. You're probably not getting enough rest. You're not able to work out. You're trying to get to the next city. You know, there's plane delays. You're in the airport forever. I mean, so it's, it's living on the road. seems glamorous to people, but, but boy, you know, after touring with bands and stuff, it's, it's, it's something, it's a great thing. It's when you're 18, 20 years old, but you know, when you're 50, you know, it's, it's like, wow, boy, I'd, 
I just feel like to sleep in my own bed tonight. He had a beautiful <laughs> house in L.A. He had all the money in the world, but he felt compelled to go out and be a comedian again. I'm sort of binging on his podcast, and um, it's very revealing. And I think he wanted to recreate himself, and there's a guy who did humor. I never found him offensive, but with the Me Too movement, I think there was a little bit of a backlash, and I think he wanted to prove... I can play it any way you want. I just want to make you laugh. And sure, I can tell dirty jokes, but I can tell R-rated jokes too. Am I right? Well, he started dirty. You know, he started blue. And and so, I mean, he, he was, uh, people that knew him and knew his act knew what it was. And and so, I mean, if you saw the aristocrats, you know, the movie, yes. you, know, you know, the aristocrats joke, I mean, his part of it is, is incredible. And and so, um, I, I think that people saw uh, the host on America's Funniest Videos, where it's all scripted and staged, and, and or saw him in, in uh, Danny Tanner, you know, and, and uh, these these types of things. But that wasn't him, you know. That wasn't the comic, you know. And so then all of a sudden, people would see him and go, "Holy cow! <laughs> Did he just say that?" And and so uh, he, you know, he liked that shock value and 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 was was there for it. And and with the uh, offensiveness to people and the the uh, you know, you do jokes and you, 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 I've given up. I think you, if you think it's funny, it is. And you should just go with it. You know, I, I mean, you do jokes that maybe the crowd finds offensive and you have to drop because you, you don't want to, or some people just don't care. And, and, and then, but you can't have walkouts or something. You know, I, I tried this joke, you know, uh, you know, why don't they play baseball in, in Wuhan? You know, uh, they eat bats. And, and you know it's it's funny, but but you can't do that. I mean, there's Chinese people, and, it, and you know it's it's probably racist. I mean, I, it's it's hard. It's 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 hard. You know, I think you know most comedy it it, it should be inclusive, and everybody should find it funny and laugh. I, I got, laugh. Yeah, I'm still tripping on your George Burns advice uh, with the self-deprecation that's worked for Joan Rivers, right? And you can disparage yourself or your wife. Rickles sort of spread it out, but Rodney Dangerfield, he was a classic, you know, I don't get any respect. And I know Saget was influenced by that. And the common thread for me, and you brought it up earlier about Jewish people, and uh, I've read the book, uh, uh, The History of uh, Jewish Humor. It's fantastic, flowing through all these shtetl comedians. It was a survival mechanism. It's no. Well, it was. It was. In, in Irish comedians, too. I mean, they were outsiders, you right. know, and 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 so their only entree, and in in black performers too, with the Chitlin Circuit and stuff, uh, you know, I, I worked with Dick Gregory, you know, and 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 so they, they their entree in, into society, mainstream society, was humor, and and I think that's why humor is it, it's oh. <sighs> The Greeks philosophers, you know, Socrates said it was the lowest emotion. The low, humor was the lowest human emotion. He didn't, you know, with, with with honor and loyalty and other things, you know, so much higher. But 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 I think probably in the very beginning, the cavemen had had to get along to hunt together or protect from the other clan. And one thing that's bonding is humor. You know, and if you see, you know, women, there's there's uh, certainly women's humor, humor, all this good. I, you know, I think women get a bad rap about not being funny, but there's very funny uh, female comics. You know, Kathleen Madigan, Nancy Norton. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, you, know, you got me uh, thinking about it. And luck uh, to get a smile from a woman is a nice thing. And we're all attracted by people smiling at us. And if you can make somebody smile or laugh, that's right. it's, that's, that's right. It's, when, when, I saw this dating thing in psychology magazine that said that, uh, one of the uh, top, uh, top five uh, character traits that a woman looked at for in a man was humor. And, and one of the top five things that men looked in a woman was a woman that thought they were funny. Right. You know? That's so, true in my relationship. So, Definitely. So you want you want somebody who thinks you're funny, and you you you, you also you, they want somebody funny. But you're not like you know you got an arrow through your head at dinner or something. You know, <laughs> you, you, you do you do things. I, I think humor is important, and it's it bonds us. You know, and I think uh, right. I mean. 
if somebody smiles at you, you know, it, it's it's endearing and it, it's disarming and it, it takes down barriers. It's the number one quality in liking somebody. Hey, they like me. Well, then I like them back. I mean, it's it's caveman. It goes way back. I have my favorite comedians and uh, Louis Anderson. Didn't he come through Denver all the time? You must have known him. Just passed away. Did you know yeah. him at all? No, I worked with Louis a lot. He he came to Denver a lot to the comedy works and really kind and I'll always remember you and, and uh, you know tortured with his upbringing, you know, and and the, his weight and, and uh, you know uh, sexual preference and and just a bit but sweet and kind and 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 killer funny, you know. I, I, to me, the best comics have rubber faces, you know. They 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 tell the joke, but they show the joke with their body and their face, their body English and their face. And the the best comics, you know, have all these expressions, and and so they they they're not just a talking head, just pumping out jokes at you, you know. I always but, saw that certain sadness to them, which uh, I felt bad. Well, that's right. That's right. They 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 got something underneath, you know, got something underneath, you know, and. and but the guy uh, I like, who I know, was a friend of yours, and we have so many people to talk about, but. Norm MacDonald was my cup of tea. I thought he was sharp and funny, and why couldn't I think, you know, to say something that clever? He he was he brilliant. Would, he would say something that was so obvious that you didn't see. In in you know, I, I think I see comics and I go, God, I wish I would have written that joke, or why didn't I think of that? And and but the thing about that a lot of these people have in common, Norm MacDonald, David Tell, um, is they're brilliant. You Norm was brilliant. And, and, you know, just <laughs> I, I sitting on the airplane next day and he goes, you're a science guy. You, you know, stuff. he goes, are, are you afraid of North Korea? And I go, I don't know. They maybe have a nuclear bomb. Yeah, I don't know. And he goes, I can't even point it out on the map. I was sitting with my kid. I just, you know, I, just, I couldn't, I don't even know. He goes, uh, and, he, and that guy, you know, he goes, I'll tell you a country I'm kind of afraid of that you might have heard of, uh, Germany. He goes, every 20 years, these guys start marching like army ants, you know, and he goes, and they declare war against the world. <laughs> you know, you know what? It, it, it's funny, and I wish I could talk to the late Norm MacDonald. Maybe he's hearing me now because I heard that one of the billionaire financiers of the January 6th insurrection was some guy named Uline. And it's, I looked him up on Wikipedia an heir of the Schlitz beer fortune. And anyway, Norm MacDonald might have appreciated that. And I know some people who share that view. What about Germany? I, I'm still not over World <laughs> yeah. War II. He's, Are you? He's like, he's, he's like, what about Germany? He goes, they declared war against the whole rest of the world. He goes, the only people that did that before were the Martians. <laughs> he goes, he goes, and he goes, and it took us four and a half years to beat him. He goes, it wasn't like we beat him in the first quarter, you know. And and, and he goes, he said, and this Hitler, he goes, the the more I read about him, the less I care for him. Oh, man, Which yeah. was such, such, right. you know, he'd, he'd act like such an ignoramus, but mm -hmm. you know, but it would be so funny. He 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 was he was just quick, you know, just so quick, and and. And, and again, very sweet, very, very sweet, you know. One of the last podcasts Saget did, I guess he did one with Maureen Cho that they edited and put out there. I, I need to listen to that. Or is it Margaret Cho, the comedian? But he did it with a B.J. Novak, who I guess was on The Office. And I'm really aware of him more from this podcast. But he opened for Saget, and Saget wanted him to tell this Hitler joke which uh, BJ was, he didn't think it was the right crowd. And you'd have to listen to the podcast, but only certain people can pull that off. And uh, yeah, Hitler, that's... It's, no, it's, it's, it's high. there's some, some topics. I worked for Willie Nelson for a long time. No, you're, he, he, oh, holy he, cow. He, he lived... He lived. He lived in Evergreen, remember? And uh, oh yeah. And, and Barry was was uh, producing his movie. And movie did and, and and doing all these things and 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 so we we worked. Chuck Grant and I we got on the road with Willie. And Willie knew every joke and he loved jokes and he'd tell jokes and and he's the only guy who saw I could get away with a Hitler joke. He go, uh, how come Hitler didn't drink tequila? I go, I don't know. He goes, it made him mean. <laughs> 
he's Hitler, you know. He's, <laughs> he's already the biggest right, and, Christian right. history of the earth. And then, and then, but he and wasn't then, a drinker. Let's stop there for a second, no. because in, and neither is Trump, I might add. And neither was Jeffrey Epstein. And since they uh, didn't drink and they didn't do drugs, I wonder what they did together for fun. Um, but when you talk about just to Norm MacDonald's serious point about Germany, it's not just that they declared war on the rest of us. It's because they thought they were better than everybody else. And they're bigots. And that bigotry, it, it could... It's it's rearing its ugly head again. To me, I saw nothing but bigotry. The same people who killed Allenberg, the same people who did Oklahoma City, the same people at Charlottesville, the same people January 6th, they all revere a book called The Turner Diaries, which is an anti-Semitic, anti-government screed. I mean, we've seen this act before, and not to get all serious on you, I guess I just did, but... That's why I need humor right now because I, I never. Well, thought- that's right. Well, we well, we need more than humor. I mean, people need to stand up and be counted, and and it's time. I mean, I, you know, I I have a bad habit. I smoke cigars, and and I I have this group of friends, and and you know, uh, half of which are black, half are white. Some guys are Jewish, some Christian, and and it, it's a great group. And and to to get a different perspective, and and to to you know to to. Uh, be exposed and, and and it does raise its head and, and to me there's kind of a social amnesia you know we we get you know martin luther king and, and his horrible murder and 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 then for a while the country is everybody's in lockstep together and and then but within a, a short time it just kind of fades back down and and you know when you, when you see people marching with tiki torches saying jews will not replace us and and what scared me about that is that I, they're not old guys like me; they were young guys, you know. And and so uh, bigotry is is you know it's it's pervasive, and but it needs to be called out, and and people need to be called out of, about different things. I mean, you know, what if, uh, to me bigotry comes from fear, you know, fear that you know you're afraid of another group's success and it's going to displace you somehow. But when really you, you, their success has nothing to do, you know, I, to me, you know, being white, uh, you know, it, it's time to acknowledge that the things have been done wrong and that there might be things that, that we can do better, of course, and, and, and acknowledge it, you know, and, and to, to, you know, uh, own up things that have been done in the past, redlining of groups for, for real estate or whatever, you know, for houses. And, and uh, I, you know, I think if white people would just, don't they don't have to change you just have to live up to what they said they always believed in you know the foundations of this country and and have everybody have a place at the table you know i, I think the the biggest thing is uh, people are fair that they're that they're going to lose something by somebody else gaining and, and it's not true and and and, and, and that's pushed on them god you're and, brilliant and, about this and i bring up alan berg but you knew the man you took care of his Dog and Airedale yeah. Fred. Yeah. What do you remember about Alan Bergen? I've studied the case. I've used my podcast to explore the life and death of Alan Berg. I know his widow. I know a lot of friends of his who are Jewish lawyers. And he was an interesting, complicated man who should be alive uh, and 88 years old right now. But he got gunned down by guys who followed the Turner Diaries and came to Denver to kill a Jewish man of prominence. I listened to his, his podcast like everybody did. His podcast, it wasn't a podcast. It was his radio it was show, a, right. His radio show. And, and, and so I didn't always agree with him, but he made you think, you know, and, and, he, and he, uh, some of it he probably did for, uh, for ratings or whatever, and, and you know, for, for uh, a stark you know, shock appeal. But, but he, he made you think about things, and I, he researched things well. And it, it, this stuff didn't come out of his hat. You know, he had he had something behind it, and I, and I think we, we we've we've lost that somehow. You know, we've 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 lost some of that. You know, I, I read in Walter Cronkite's uh, autobiography or biography, I guess whoever he wrote it with somebody right. else. Um, you know, he said, when I read the news, you shouldn't know my opinion. I'm just telling you what happened. You know, and we've we've lost that. We've lost that. You yeah. know. We, we, and we no, lost uh, we lost Betty White. I don't want to end this without you talking about Betty White because not only did you know her well from show business, 
this lady might have been one of the greatest animal advocates of all time, and that's your passion. Tell us about Betty. She would have been 100 this week. 100 years, you know. I, I, to me, it looks good on paper. I don't know if I want to live to be 100, you know. But, but, uh, but she made it work? Well, she made it work because she was active the whole time in, in, until the last few years when she, you know, it just her age caught up with her, and and and, and she was lovely. I mean, whatever you, you could say about her, it, you couldn't say it enough. And and like Joan Rivers, had time for every fan and and um, wanted to know about them. Keith Richards too, you know, asking people. He'd always ask people, "What do you do?" And the guy would tell him, and would walk away. He go, "See." All people want to do is talk about themselves, and, and mm-hmm. they'd walk away going, "Man, he's a great guy." And he hadn't said anything; they mm-hmm. just talked about themselves. Right. So, so they knew they knew how to, how to bridge, you know, and and uh, connect with people. And so, I don't know. I, I hope I hope that the, this thing has been interesting. <laughs> it doesn't seem to me oh, like it, we it, touched it, on. And, oh, I think it's very interesting. I mean, Betty I don't White. Want to lay it down. No, that this is fantastic, but. But tell everybody the influence Betty White had around here with respect to the animal welfare community. Well, she raised, uh, I, I mean, I don't even know how much money for the Morris Animal Foundation and the research they do. And, and she was uh, instrumental in, in different studies on animal cancer and kidney failure and stuff that they do at different institutions and veterinary colleges uh, and, and universities. But, and she was big on conservation uh, at the end. You know, I, I've been w- with the uh, Denver Zoo to, to the, you know, both the Arctic and Antarctic to, to do different work. And, and uh, she, you know, there's 10 million other forms of life on the planet besides us. And we were given this wonderful intellect that we have, uh, humans, and, and this wonderful biodiversity. And and the, all the other animals are waiting for us to use our intellect to save the place, you know, and, and we're doing a bad job. But I think I think there's time. Uh, I'm optimistic. I think we, uh, you know, I, I think that I'm. A, you have to be a radical optimist, and because we we can't lose this one. I mean, we have to. The th- biggest thing for me that makes me optimistic is going to schools and talking to children about conservation and different things. Uh, well, let's and, put and, you in and, charge, and, and, Kevin, because I know you're a climate change activist. You've been all over the world. You've studied this. You've seen the impact on the animal world. If you were in charge, if Joe Biden had the good sense to say, Kevin, what should I do? What would you tell him? Well, the first thing I think is that to, in, in terms of the, you know, the ecology uh, in the world, tomorrow's not going to look like today. It was just too many of us. And, and you know, can we do better? And the Denver Zoo did a great thing with their conservation department with uh, buying a place in, in, in helping the Mongolians obtain 187,000 acres of Mongolia of, of wilderness and protecting the wilderness and the, the endangered species that live there. And and so it, it would break my heart if children could only see a polar bear in, in, in a uh, to be a little boy from Denver and get to see a polar, a live polar bear in the wild is, I mean, it's, you can't, there's nothing like it and, and you can't put any money on it. And and most people feel like that. Most people, like, like we saw, you know, there's been a change in how people think and they value other, other forms of life. And we're naturally a- attracted to it. You know, children learn about dinosaurs. Four-year-old kids can tell you every dinosaur name and they just naturally do it. And, and so uh, I, I think, uh, I think if if I had to do it, I would uh, spend more money on education, and and on uh, I would take companies that are eco friendly and give them tax breaks. I would um, try and stimulate research in, into uh, alternative energy. Uh, you know, I, there's so many things we could do, and and you know, I think if we look at where our money is spent, you know, I, I think finally we're looking at infrastructure and how old our bridges are. But also we have to look at, um, you know, uh, with the forms of cancer that we have and, and uh, you know, prostate cancer and breast cancer in this country, you know, just rampant. And you know, everybody knows somebody with, with one or the other and, and you know, how much money we spend on, on other things. And I, I think it comes back down to, to education. You've got the biggest heart. That's what shows. That's why you're successful in so many different aspects, and your heart shined through in this podcast. I can't thank you enough. You've done so many things. 
uh, helped so many people, made a lot of people laugh. But to quote you, buddies, the Rolling Stones, have you gotten satisfaction and have you figured out what gives you the most satisfaction? Well, I think the best thing we do is, is when our, our best higher angels are, 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 that talk to us is when we, we serve. You know, our best thing is to serve others. You know, that, that's, I don't know, I think that, that you know, and be kind. If anything I've learned in, in, in 70 years is, is you, know, you know, love and kindness save the day. That's, that's all. That's beautiful. For a guy who participates in roasts and all of that, and uh, you, you swing a gentle sword. That's why everybody loves you, Kevin Fitzgerald. I mean, you made a record of what is going on in the world right now. You get the last word. What else would you like to say? We can always do better, and we 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 can we we need to learn. And we need to progress and we need to evolve and we need to learn from our mistakes. It, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you don't keep making the same ones. <laughs> That's the hopeful upbeat stuff because to me, most of the problems are by our contemporaries. We baby boomers, we didn't do that great following the greatest generation. But tonight at the comedy club, you're going to have contract, contact with the next generation. I'm hoping they're better and smarter than we are. And, and no, can, I, I, I love millennials. I, I respect anybody that can live a thousand years. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect ending right there. Dr. Kevin, thank, thank you, you so much. I, I hope I didn't let you down. I hope no, that was all right. you, you didn't let me down at all. You are a star. You always are. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for having me. All You're right. welcome. Bye now. Thank you. It's hot in here. Did that toaster catch on fire? It wasn't that. You choked on that bite of burnt bagel. Why is everything all red? The heat is unbearable. Where am I? Excuse me, your dishonor. May I step in on behalf of my client? Mr. Silverman, proceed. Tell me one redeeming good thing your client did. He was a faithful listener to my radio show. Not good enough. He had decency and compassion for his family. He did end-of-life planning with Michael Bailey. The Michael Bailey? That is kind to your loved ones. That is smart and way too decent for this place. Your client can go. And what about me, your despicableness? Why should I? Michael Bailey is my lawyer, too. Go on, then. Get out of here. <laughs> now, part of that was serious, and part of that was fictional. But you will die someday, and if you don't make a legal plan, the government will make one for you. Call my lawyer, Michael Bailey. His rates are reasonable, and he can meet with you and your spouse wherever you want, and on weekends and evenings. 720-394-6887 or online at MB Law. LLC.com. Now back to the Fred Silverman Show. Hey, maybe you know my voice and me from the first half of my career when I was Denver prosecutor. Or maybe you know me from my time on the radio and now on my podcast. But my real job for several decades now has been to fight in the civil arena for victims of crimes. I've been fighting for Colorado crime victims for the last four decades. If your life has been damaged through the misconduct of others, there's a great new Colorado law, and it's for you. It allows victims as far back as January 1, 1960, to hold accountable the perpetrators and the organizations that allowed it to happen. If you were sexually assaulted, now is the time to come forward. Let's expose the truth. Let's get you some justice. Let me be your voice for a confidential consultation. Call me anytime you are ready at 303-861-2800. Ask for Craig, Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. Troubadour, you know how we can tell we are good buddies? How's that? Because we are in the same studio. But you walked so close to me when we walked yesterday that I figured, what the hell? We're re- are we relaxing our social distancing protocol? I don't know. It's, uh, I think we should say happy anniversary. Is it the second anniversary? It is. Of the Two Craig years. Silverman? No, no, no. no. Two years oh. of pandemic. Wait. And yeah. while I am asking the question, how, how many? No, we're getting and close. And this is episode 80. 80. It's really 82 if you count two Dave Gunder specials, which I think we should. But that's quite an accomplishment right there. But no, it's been two years. 
since the pandemic, uh, the first case is in America. Yes, it seems like two years. Oh, my God. We're in a tough time, but I, I have the perfect show because it's all about fun. I have a comedian on, and I asked you to give me your funniest song, and you did it. Way to go. Well, I'm not a comedy writer, but I, it's my funniest song in the sense that it's, a, it's, it's satirical, that kind of humor. I'll tell you how it's perfect, because it's funny. And your first line, do you remember it? I you, do. Okay, say it. You say that you love me a hundred long years. That's more than enough, I assure you, my dear. And had she been alive this last Tuesday, which woman would have turned 100 years old? Betty White. Betty White, who was a friend of Kevin Fitzgerald, our tremendous guest. But uh, you and I are concerned about the world, and I just... I figured some things out. You want to hear it? Always. All right. We can agree there's a Russian mafia, right? Yes. And the leader of the Russian mob is indisputably... Putin. Putin is a mobster-type guy, correct? He is. And uh, our former president had mobster tendencies and seemed to have... A kinship with Putin, correct? That's right. And Putin definitely helped Trump become elected in 2016. And I'd say they were partners in that venture. Whether it was formalized or not, they tried to help him. And he he appreciated it. He even asked for their help. Right. Okay, so they're partners in crime. And I know a little about law enforcement. And when you're closing in on one of the mobster criminals— then expect the rest of the mob to react. So Putin is surrounding Ukraine. And meanwhile, the January 6th committee, the Department of Justice, prosecutors in Georgia, prosecutors in New York are all tightening the news around Donald Trump. So, of course, Putin is going to do something to distract and confuse and complicate the situation. And let's remember their other plot involved Ukraine in the first place, Ukraine, which Putin never wanted to give up, Ukraine, which Trump wanted to use as a vehicle to destroy his political opponent. It just seems to me it's, if I could put it as simply as I could, as we close in on Trump, of course Putin is going to cause problems. Does that make sense? Mm. I don't know yet. All right. <laughs> well, uh, are you saying that that this is a distract? You're saying that that Putin is 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 so loyal to his buddy Trump that he would he would purposely set up a um, a, a diversion, which is Ukraine. Okay, the amassing of two a diversion so as to ease the um, the. If the, you're going to invade this... Ukraine, when's the right time? And. And what's the right moment? But my question, though, Craig, is is what does Putin care about Trump? Because he wants to mess up America. Nobody messes up America like Trump. That's been his goal all along to destabilize democracy. And he's gotten tremendous bang for his buck. And speaking of bucks, all those Russian oligarchs paying gazillions of dollars for Trump properties in Florida and New York— this shit ain't that hard to figure out. Well, I don't know. I don't know, Craig. I think it's a creative. I think it's 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 creative, you know, in terms of the of the link. But you know, the other thing I would argue is that Ukraine isn't going to impact this investigation of Trump it, by the New York Attorney General and everything, and the Supreme Court and everything that's happening in terms of them telling him to turn over what they want. Here's the thing. I'm obsessing about January 6th and Trump's criminality. But for good reason, a lot of people are more concerned about inflation, about the stock market taking crap, about uh, their kids not being able to go to school, and Joe Biden being obviously uh, not a major league pitcher. And it's upsetting. America's never been quite like this. And they will say it's Biden's fault and be more receptive to the Trump bullshit. And I'm saying 
we can move on as a country until we deal with this Trump bullshit. We really can't. And the other thing that's come to me is that Putin's a bigot. So is Trump. So are most authoritarians. And we've seen what bigotry did to your father's time growing up as a boy in Munich. It's it's just destructive. It's terrible. And I'm afraid it's repetitive. And I, I'm just at the end of my rope with the people who enable it. You know, I want to go after people who enabled sex offenders like they found out at University of Michigan. Have you heard about that? No. Oh, I heard something in, in passing. Right. And people confuse yeah. it. And yeah. it's like Steve Bannon fled the zone. People hear it so much. Is it Michigan? Is it Michigan State? Well, Michigan State had Larry Nasser, who was U.S. Olympic Committee. Michigan, the great University of Michigan, one they had a president who got in trouble because he had sex with his subordinate, apparently, with emails saying, I'd like to share my knish with you. I think I can read that little Yiddish. But then they had to pay a bunch for this Dr. Anderson, who gave exams to everybody on campus, including Bo Schembechler's son. Do you remember who Bo Schembechler was? No. He was the famous coach of Michigan before... uh, before modern times, he he was pitted against Woody Hayes, who coached at Ohio State. And both of them were uh, hardened football men of the Midwest, Vince Lombardi types, although Lombardi was smarter and from the East Coast, I think. But Woody Hayes got in trouble for hitting his own player, something Bruce Arians did last game for Tampa Bay. But Shem Beckler, he died uh, of a heart attack. And now stuff's coming out because his son is one of the victims of this, Dr. Anderson. And when he was 10 and told his dad about it, his dad punched him with a closed fist and said, don't ever talk that way again. And so now Michigan's reexamining the legacy of Bo Schembechler, and they paid out a lot of money on the same kind of laws that I'm looking to enforce in Colorado because I can't stand that sort of stuff. But my point is this. I wrote a column about birds of a feather flock together. Putin's a bigoted, I'm better than everybody kind of guy. Same with Trump, same with authoritarians, Mussolini types. Do you know where the term fascist comes from? There's a new symbol. They just disclosed a bunch of Patriot Front internal communications. They're part of this right-wing MAGA stuff. But I'm pretty aware to anti-Semitism. Uh, do you know... Where fascism originated? Yeah, that's a fascist. The, the term? Yeah. I think it's F-A-S-C-E. Do you know right. what that is? Fascia. It's when you take like a bunch of twigs and stuff and you bind them together and picture that artist's image. That's what they're stenciling on signs around Denver, putting out leaflets, anti-Semitic bullshit. And they were leading the Right to Life movement in Washington on Friday. We're recording this Friday afternoon. They were at the forefront, and some group on the other side, and I bless them, said, hey, you know what, you guys? All your secret names have just been released, and way to go. And now they are, and there are tentacles in Colorado. And these guys take on the... You know, they lead the pro-life parade. That's one of the ways they get in. A lot of these authoritarian regimes, like in Iran, they don't let women have uh, the freedom to control their own body. And there's this woman, Jenna Ellis. We've done shows about her. Because how many people do I know who are big parts of this treasonous plot? And yet my old partner, Kaplis, praises her like she's a top five lawyer in the world. And... I've met her. I I can't quite believe it. So what's the affinity? Because they're pro-life together. But you know what? When pro-life gets in bed with the Patriot Front, it pisses me off. And I'm doing all I can to, uh, I mean, Jen Ellis has information critical to America. She's been requested to give information to our Congress. And she's playing games. You know what she said to them on Twitter? No. She said, is this because you want to date me? What's that supposed to mean? (laughs) That she fancies herself some babe uh, who isn't, believe me. But she's trying to say, uh, parrot uh, AOC, who is getting grief. And she said to the right wing, 
Are you having fantasies about me? Do you want to date me? So right. Jen Ellis repeated that. that. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's okay to Twitter banner, but how about some truth to uh, prosecutors and investigators so we can figure out what happened on January 6th and what an organized plot this was? I mean, this is so all-encompassing, this uh, plot to steal. It, it's... It's going to be the greatest criminal case ever put together. But in the meantime, what happens if it, the people are turned off to it? They don't want to listen. I, I, I just don't know how this ends. I don't know how it ends well for America. That's why I wanted to do a fun show, have a fun song, but I'll let you react to any of this stuff because I know what can make us smile at the end. Oh, oh what, what do you think about all this? Am I am I right? Am I wrong? Uh, it's a huge concern. No, it's very very troubling. And even me and Craig, I can't see that that you know that 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 politics in the world, uh, you know the 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 world scenario is something in the forefront of my mind. I I I uh, I'm you know interested in music. I run my business. I've got my family. I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of I'm, I wouldn't say apolitical, but more towards that, obviously, than you. And even someone like me, when I think about it, it's very, very troubling. And as I see us moving towards the, the uh, 2022 election, which is what? It's, not, it's, it's a matter of, what, 10 months away? And I brought up you to know, you that yeah, Trump could be a speaker of the House. Yeah, that idea, the idea of a Trump re-election, I mean, it's, it's, it's really troubling. And, what, and, and, and the, the thing that really, that I, I, that I ponder most is is how we can make a change before these things come to be these nightmare scenarios come to be how, what we can do what we can do to try to get a a more um you know reasonable dialogue and get 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 people to to try to be together and and you know working through our problems as a country rather than us versus them it's just getting us nowhere it's vitriol and um do you remember our solution before the election? What, what, what were we saying? That Trump needed to be defeated by a sufficient margin, right. which right. he was. We thought he was. Right. And what did he say? What I won he, by a landslide. By a landslide. And everybody knows it. And everybody knows it. No, that's really troubling. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But I still think, and the Supreme Court did come through and ordered the disclosure of documents and now Ivanka is under subpoena and she may have to testify or go to jail you just don't know what's going to happen next with this crazy old world but if you get documents and if you get airtight cases and if you get embarrassing stuff that would cause even 10 or 12 percent of his supporters to say you know what sir you're gone we're going to go to Ron DeSantis and we can move on to other uh, wackadoodles, but this guy's a unique threat. So I'm hoping that the law will bring him to where he needs to go. And you know what is another big tell about Donald Trump being a terrible person? He, he doesn't like dogs. <laughs> well, yeah, I think nothing more need be said. Right. This well, show is dedicated to dogs, humor, and... Wait till you hear this song by Dave Gunders, our troubadour. It's called Hole in the Head. It's funny and profound. And that 100-year reference, we're dedicating that to Betty White. Thanks, troubadour. Thanks, Craig. That you love me a hundred long years. It's more than enough, I assure you, my dear. You tell me I need you, well, that may be true. Just not in the way that you think that I do. You said, I need you. Like a bird needs the sky On a wing and a prayer I thought we would fly Yeah, I need you But it's not how you said I need you Like a hole in the head Don't think 
me unkind for telling the truth. It's better for me and it's better for you. This our little romance ain't all that I dreamed. Sometimes you get crazy, sometimes you're just mean. And I need you like a man needs a drink. I'm so drunk already, you can't even think. And yes, I was angry, but it's true what I said. I need you like a hole in the head. I said, give me a minute. You left for an hour. And when you returned, your expression was sour. Cause my friends had come over. Yeah, they didn't even call. A blind man can see you don't like them at all. And I need you like a jewel needs a thief. Your heart is a stone kept safe out of reach. You don't like my music, I got too hard a bed. I need you like a hole in the head. So go find another lover instead. Michael Bailey, a friend, a lawyer, a sponsor. Tell everybody how you bring peace of mind to their life. So by setting up your estate plan, you know what's going to happen to your stuff when you die. You know where it's going to go, you know who's going to get it. We've got everything in place so we're not running to a court to try to get guardianship and conservatorship as quickly as possible. But then it's an orderly proceeding of things. So, you know, there's already enough chaos with the medical emergency, but the legal part of it and who can make decisions is all outlined. It's all set up. So there's, it's like the the smooth transition of power. That's cool because you can avoid so many problems by having a medical power of attorney and discussing it with a smart guy like Michael Bailey, because who should have this? It's probably somebody close. Who do you trust most among your children to make that call? These are the hard and good questions that you ask every day, right, Michael? Right. And if you ask them beforehand, when you're not in the middle of a crisis, then when a crisis hits, we're not trying to do crisis management and medical emergency and everything else. We're going, okay, we've got a smooth transition of power here. We've got a smooth who's in charge, and we can have that all flow so that we can focus on the care. There are so many things in life that you can fill out a form and save yourself money, save yourself heartache. Some people die out of nowhere quickly, but more often you get sick, you have medical difficulties, so it all goes together. But your system works, it works beautifully. What is the best way to contact you these days? Best way, uh, you can give me a call. My phone number is 720-394-6887. And again, that's 720-394-6887. Or you can go online to michaelbaileylawllc.com. And there is a an appointment page on my website that you can use. So either way is fine. Thanks, Michael. Hey, if you like this show, please shout it out on your Purple Apple podcast app. It would be so wonderful if you would scroll down, spot that place to leave a five-star review and your personal review. Kind words appreciated. Thanks so much. Tell your friends. Now, that's a heck of a show. Thank you, Troubadour, but we are not done yet because I want to play for you the sound of Dan Kaplis extolling the virtues of Jenna Ellis, not just this past week when she got subpoenaed by the January 6th committee 
And let me just stop there. For anybody out there with a microphone or a Twitter account who want to belittle this committee as politically biased, do you say that about prosecutions? If they come out of Denver, are they politically biased in the way of a Democrat? 18th JD, politically biased? Look with that. Look on that with suspicion. I think that's bullshit. And I can't stand the people who say, oh, January 6th, there's nothing to see here. It's a bunch of biased this or that. My God, Liz Cheney is on there. She is a rock-ribbed conservative. She was until she stood up to Trump. Adam Kinzinger, the same thing. So for anybody who says you can't trust this committee, don't even look at it, you are enabling the crime of the century and the cover-up. And you need to stop doing that. Please stop doing that for all that's good in the world. In honor of Betty White, who tells a joke at the end of this, but... I sort of thought it was a joke of sorts when I got challenged by Dan Kaplis and his producer to debate Jen Ellis. Here's how this came down a couple months ago. And in response to it, I let Dan know I wanted to accept the challenge, the charity aspect, everything that he wanted to pay for, put it up on Twitter. You will remember this. Here's what I'm leading up to. All of these snipers and snarkers taking their shots at Jenna Ellis, I will pay, I will fund it, I will underwrite it to see you debate Jenna Ellis on a topic of your choice. And all I suggest is that you write your will in in advance, right? Can you imagine any of these people who snipe at Jenna Ellis debating her publicly on anything? Pick your topic. (laughs) It's not, yeah, it's she a lot would easier wipe to the take floor with shots. them. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm just being honest about it. She would wipe the floor with them. So the challenge is out there. Any of the snipers, the snarkers, the Jenna critics, and again, she and I have had some knockdown drag outs on air where we've disagreed about things. But any of those out there who are calling her names, doubt her abilities as a lawyer or whatever, we will give you this radio show as a forum. We'll make a contribution to the charity of your choice. Let's have the debate. Come on this radio show and debate Jenna on anything you want to. Think we'll have any takers on that, Ryan? Well, I mean, there might be a, a few. Really? Uh, uh, that Okay. Uh, Who do you think would take us up on that? Craig Silverman. Oh, I'd love to have Craig come on. <laughs> could you imagine? And you know Brother Craig. I mean, yeah, could you imagine? so many good memories in this studio. <laughs> I accepted the offer, offer, acceptance, contract, accept. It turns out to be a bunch of bullshit. That's what Jenna is, bullshit that's going to ruin the country. Yet Dan Kaplis loves her, won't brook any disagreement about her. It's got to be their love of Christianity, a shared commitment to the pro-life movement, because I've never seen anybody quite so blinded or have I? Oh, yeah, Tim Tebow, remember him? And an irrational affection for that guy on the part of my radio partner. And you know what? That's the fun and game section of the world. And Tim Tebow seemed like a great guy and an entertaining quarterback. And what a year that was. But at a certain point, facts are facts. Forget about football. Let's think about America. The facts are that that January 6th insurrection was part of a larger plot, and anybody with a brain can see it, and Jenna Ellis was part of that plot. So I'm bothered by anybody who comes to the defense of Jenna Ellis, who is really on the side of Michelle Malkin, the Groypers. She just got a new director of operations who was a buddy of Madison Cawthorn. It's the white power crowd. The white power crowd that killed Alan Berg. Bruce Pierce used to peddle the Turner Diaries. You heard about that with my interview with Stephen Singular. Aryan Nations formed 83. Alan Berg killed 84. Oklahoma City, Tim McVeigh loved the Turner Diaries. The same fascist crap. Now we have Patriot Front exposed, thank God at the forefront of the pro-life movement. Let's talk about that. And when you falsely accuse people of, oh, you're the racist, no. 
No, we see what's going on. I couldn't believe when I kept hearing that talk about it's a coup. The Dems are committing a coup against Trump. Who really was committing a coup? And who softened the ground for Donald Trump, the guy who wanted to commit this plot against America, a plot against democracy, a plot where Jenna Ellis is so caught up in it? dismissed by most lawyers, but not Dan Kaplis, who celebrates her like this. He said, oh, she was fired from Weld County, a DA's job. I don't know if she was fired or not, but I know this. It, it, because if somebody's let go from a job, that doesn't make them an incompetent attorney. Some of the greatest lawyers in American history were let go from jobs. And I can tell you as a guy who has practiced, uh, I believe, at a very high level for 38 years, been in a lot of courtrooms and, and you can look at my track record. It's real. Jenna Ellis, I, I could count on one hand the number of, of, you know, practicing lawyers I've met, you know, who, who are as impressive as Jenna Ellis. I mean, she is absolutely brilliant. Her command of the law. I think she's one of the last people any lawyer would want to see in the courtroom on the other side. So some Yahoo's going to call the show and say she's incompetent. Well, back it up. And looks like he chose to pack it up rather than back it up because he is gone, as I would expect anybody to be who would try to call this show and say she's an incompetent lawyer. I heard this big lie start on November 16, 2020. Jen Ellis was a guest on Dan Kaplis. My name came up, so I felt it gave me entree to text Dan Kaplis and say, don't go with this big lie that Jen Ellis and Sidney Powell are foisting on America. And it was more of the same. Jen Ellis is the finest and blah. Come on, man. I don't text. You can go places, but don't go with this white power plan against America. It's a plot against America. It's horrible. It's fascistic. It's Patriot Front. It's the Proud Boys. Stand back and stand by. That's what Trump said. Peter Boyles was behind this all the way. He entertained Joe Altman. Joe Altman came on the air. I mean, it was a multi-pronged strategy involving all elements of Denver Trump radio. And Corcoran brought him on. And Malkin had him on. You know that Nick Fuentes got subpoenaed by the J6 committee. Not that you'd ever hear that on Denver Trump radio. Or an honest discussion about that bigot Michelle Malkin. That fascistic bigot. They created this Dominion lie, and Peter Boyles was the vehicle. He gave him the softest interview. Peter Boyles had Kellogg on, General Kellogg, one opportunity. I think it was in November, but he asked, are you warm enough? I'm not going to ask you any hard questions, sir. Yet, thank God, General Kellogg answered some hard questions for the January 6th committee, including Ivanka was trying to get her dad to call this crap off. It's all going to come out. It all is coming out. But will people pay attention? Meanwhile, you got a guy, Boyles, leading Denver Trump radio with his bigoted mentality where Jews like Jared Polis are wicked smart and Jared Kushner, another wicked smart Jew. And the Jews are smart and manipulative and other people are dummies. And he says Donald Trump Jr. is a dummy. No, actually, I met Donald Trump Jr. with Casey Bloyer with me, and he was pretty bright. Eric, I don't know if he's that bright, but the guy that Boyles revered was Donald Trump himself with all his bigotries, including that birther bullshit against Barack Obama that they loved together. Boyles loves mobsters and mobsterism and uh, mafioso crap, fake tough guy stuff. And so he's talking about who's going to flip. And it's an interesting thing to speculate about. Do you think Don Jr. <laughs> believes his dad lost? Yes. No, no. Uh, there's one I you don't. don't think so? No, I think he may be the dumbest of all of them. And I, um, you know, Don, Don Jr., I think, I think, Jer I think uh, Kushner, Jared, he, he knows his, he knows his father. Yeah, Jared lost. knows it. Yeah, that sure. He, he's, lost. he's wicked smart. You know, and Trump, in my reading, uh, Trump uh, pardoned his father who was, he was a swindler. His father was a swindler. And, um, yeah. and but Jared's Apple brilliant. doesn't fall far, does no, it? No, but no, Jared's, Jared's way smart. I mean, of all of them, next to the Donald, 
Jared's smart, and that's why, you know, Donald Trump leans on him. But, you know, remember, he stayed out of the country during the crazy. He didn't come home. Oh, that's true. He did, he, he was he was gone. He was, in, right. middle, he was in the Middle East, yeah. And when so, we had Jenna and, and yeah, all absolutely. the crazy. <laughs> no, he's, listen, watch these people. I can't imagine Jenna Ellis is going to be able to offer a no. thing to anybody. No, she, she's going to sit but, there and no, she's, strum her lip. And, no, she, she doesn't know what well, she's she, doing. She, they walked her into this, but they... They said, "Hey, you and, and Jenna and, and and America's mayor and the Kraken and I mean, it, it's just one of them. One of them's going to flip." I could have picked any number of sound bites of Peter Boyle's belittling Jenna Ellis. He belittles everybody. My God, the things he said about Bill Ritter, Stan Garnett, me when we had our blow up. The guy is just a bad person. And he proves it over and over. Here's one of the ways he talked about Jenna Ellis, but believe me, there's worse, and there are many of them. Contrary to the guy he advertises for, Dan Kaplis, who says she's top five lawyer in the world material. Jenna Ellis, yeah. Jen, Jenna Ellis I think if she lost three IQ points, they have to water her once a week. <laughs> That's exactly. No, you blow it in your ear and get yeah. a tune. I, yeah. I felt the no. same way and, whenever. But, her no, she's not. She's not very bright, but. And now here is the fun soundbite as Peter Boyles turned and jumped off the Trump train as he realized that everybody was getting sued over the big lie. He had to change course. And now he's belittling those people like Mike Lindell, who still advertises on his show on 710 KNUS. Lindell, who's another terrible person who's involved in a plot against America, the undermining of democracy. I'm not going to pull my punches anymore. And now Peter Boyles, he wants to save his own ass, as always. But listen to what he says about how uh, it's going to be Dominion Pillows, because Dominion's going to own Mike Lindell's My Pillow company. Well, what about the lawsuit against KNUS, where you are noted and cited, Peter Boyles? Is it going to be Dominion NUS, Dominion Radio? Boy, there's no self-reflection there. There really isn't. And when Kirk Whitland was a white power neo-Nazi guy working at that station, did they talk about that? No, they don't talk about those things. And Boyles, who now that he doesn't want to get sued, will talk about Trump. What about that perfect call? that he claimed he made to Ukraine, that he claims now he had another perfect call to Raffensperger. But you bought that first bullshit. You didn't realize that if we didn't remove this guy, then and there, America was in trouble. I was trying to argue about it, but Boyles was unwilling because he's a gutless wonder. He can come on my show anytime to debate it, as can Dan Kaplis. They know how to reach me. Dan Kaplis, who challenged me, well, it was really Ryan Schuling who brought it up that I'm supposed to debate Jenna Ellis. Bring it on. She won't talk to anybody now because she's hiding the truth from the American people. Yet she's got a defender in Dan Kaplis and the people on Denver Trump Radio, minus Peter Boyles, who doesn't want to get sued personally. I don't know. I mean, it's like it's unraveling when the committee is widening its scope on the tr- in the Trump's orbit. And now you sure. get Giuliani, you get, uh, uh, get Ellis, you get Powell, you get Uncle Boris, and they're all – and somebody's going to flip. Yep. Somebody's going to flip. And, and whoever's left is trying to just get make sure they can get a hold of whatever my pillow inventory is still left. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I've, been calling it, I've been calling it my Dominion pillow. <laughs> right, gonna, exactly. They're going to own Take that. one of them pillows for me. I, yeah. want, <laughs> I want some of them slippers. <laughs> And Jenna Ellis, who says, so you want to date me to the January 6th committee, doing her AOC impression when I could tell you she's furthest from attractive. In every sense of the word, Jenna Ellis, to me, is now repulsive the way she has turned against America in her defense. And this may be her defense. I'm not that bright, Your Honor. I thought... The vice president could do these things. I thought I could write a check on Dan Kaplan's account and cash it at the bank. I just thought, you know, I can't. Oh, well, guess what? I got a D in law school and con law. 
Did they let you pass? Where did you go to Richmond Law School? Did they let you pass with a D? Apparently. I took Jen Ellis on in the New York Times. I did not do it lightly. I've written columns about her, and I want to put her down because she is hurting America. I went through uh, law school. Um, constitutional law was actually my worst subject. I got a D. I know. It was terrible. You didn't know that. <laughs> but in law school, it, I didn't understand it. And now let's end with some humor and wish for a better week in honor of Betty White, who heard this joke from Rue McClanahan, and it made me laugh, and I hope it does for you. And when Betty starts laughing, I hope you start laughing, and I hope you have a great week. Until next time, thanks for listening. And please tell a friend, review, subscribe, do all that. Sure would appreciate it. Bye-bye. I heard a funny one last night. Let's see now. The guy's on a desert island. Gets shipwrecked with a pig and a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so after about a month, the pig starts to look pretty good. <laughs> and he starts, you know, caressing her feet, <laughs> tweaking her little nose, and the dog gets real jealous and attacks him. <laughs> and so he has to give it up. I and mean, the dog's really biting him, so he has to give it up. About a month later, the dog's asleep. He thinks he'll try it again. He creeps over the pig. Just starts, The dog wakes up, growls, and attacks him again. So he has to give it up. About a month later, there's a beautiful blonde shipwreck on the island. <laughs> world-class woman. <laughs> he says, thank God. He said, will you help me? Will you hold that dog for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Tune in live every Saturday morning, 9 to noon, Mountain Time. Visit thecraigsilvermanshow.com for the podcast, blog, and more. Be sure to subscribe on all major podcasting platforms to be updated when new episodes are available. This has been The Craig Silverman Show.